Hi, and welcome to the 2021 Arkansas Cotton Production Meeting. My name is Bill Robertson, Extension Cotton Agronomist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Ag Cooperative Extension Service, and I'll serve as your host today. Thanks for joining us for the 2021 virtual version of our cotton production meetings. We've got a great program, and we'll be ready to answer your production questions at the end of the program. The session is being recorded and will be posted on the same location where you registered. Before we get started, we'd like to thank Cotton Incorporated for their support of our research and education program, our extension programs. Today's program counts as two and a half CEUs for CCAs and Arkansas Ag Consultants. The CEUs are, there's a half a credit for nutrient management, half a credit for crop management, and one and a half credits for IPM. Please remember that to receive full credit, you'll need to stay for the full event using your unique login. So at the completion of the program, we will automatically submit CEUs for all attendees who provided their license numbers. So to get your CEUs, all you need to do is stay on for the full session. But as a side note, the CEUs will not be submitted until all the programs have been uh, conducted. And so the, the soybean program is the early February. So it may be toward the end of February before your CEUs show up on your end. If you have any questions, please send an email to Jerry Clemens. That's J-C-L-E-M-O-N-S at U-A-E-X dot E-D-U if you have any questions. So we'd like to welcome those of you who have attended our in-person production meetings in the past. And thank you for working with us on this new uh, program format, as well as our traditional programs that we've used in the past. For those of you who are new to our production meetings, we hope this event is informative and helpful. We miss seeing you face to face and we hope to be able to do that again. But we've worked hard to make this event one that we hope you'll find helpful as you fine tune your 2021 game plans for cotton. We've got five presentations to share today with updates from our extension specialist. After each, pre each presentation, we'll take a question or two time permitting but once all the presentations are over, we'll have a Q&A session to get to your questions. So go ahead and use the Q&A box to submit questions that's located at the bottom of your screen. Today, I'll be your first presenter, and I'll be discussing variety selection. Hi, I'm Bill Robertson, Cotton Extension Agronomist with the University of Arkansas System, Division of Ag, Cooperative Extension Service. Before I begin, I really need to, to acknowledge my crew and thank them. That's Amanda Free, Joe McAlee, and Whitney Haywood. And also want to thank Cotton Incorporated uh, for their support and, and you know, both financially of, of my program. And uh, certainly do appreciate all the help I get from them and our Cotton State Support Committee. If we step back and look at last year, uh, see how we come out in 2020, we were down a little bit on acres. You know, we've been on a on a steady stream of increased acres for the last uh, few years, but we were down about 90,000 acres from last year. Uh, they had us pegged at, at harvesting 520,000 acres. Going into August, we had an exceptional crop. I really thought our projected yields are going to be somewhere around 1,300 pounds. Uh, NAS still has us at about 1,200 pounds, and again, that would put us at all-time record high yield, up 15 pounds from last year. Our production were down about a little over 200,000 bales from last year. You know, if we look at, at kind of what people are thinking about for next year, I, I hear people talk about as low as, as, you know, I think we're going to be down. Uh, the low number down is about 10% down. The high number down is about 30% down. And, uh, you know, with the way commodity prices are going, cotton is kind of taking a jump, but it's really kind of following the coattails of some of the other commodities. Um, but, you uh, I, I really feel like we're probably going to be down somewhere in the 15 to 20% range on acres planted in 2021. Now, if we look and, you know, we talk about the, the issues, uh, you know, on, on trying to be profitable in, in crop production, if we're going to be profitable in cotton production. I really think, you know, our number one limiting factor is, is uh, soil health, is soil structure. And so if, if you're not looking at cover crops or thinking about cover crops, I'd like you to think about uh, getting cover crops on your radar screen. Here we're going to talk about varieties, you know, kind of when to plant, uh, plant populations. Uh, but being profitable in cotton is more than just planting the right varieties and, and all that. Our fertility programs, you know, if we can get as close as we can to the 4R strategy using the right rate at the right time, at the right place, and, and, and the right source, 
when we match those things as best we can to the needs of the cotton crop, we can be more efficient with a fertility program and and cut back on our rates and 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 be uh, kind of a win-win for everybody. Our plant growth regulators uh, got to be timely on those. We've got some varieties like like a 1646. It's pretty aggressive, so we have to be really aggressive on our on our plant growth regulators. And you know, 1646 was planted on about half the acres in Arkansas this year, and we were pretty aggressive on those. And I think they had an impact on our variety testing program data, especially at our county level. We got several folks on the program today that are going to be talking about pest management, so I'll skip past that irrigation. You know, most years we got to be ready to, to irrigate. If Mother Nature doesn't give us rain in the middle of June, we're going to have to be ready to irrigate by about the 18th to 20th. You know, that's why some of the years when we get some some good rainfall about that middle of June, that really goes a long ways toward giving us uh, kind of our some of our record breaking yields. And when we make a crop, we need to try to do it in three weeks of effective bloom. And effective bloom is that period from first flower to cut out. Three weeks, three weeks of effective bloom, we can make the cotton that we want to make. And then when we get to effective bloom or cut out, cut out defines our last effective bowl population or our last money bowl. Those are the last bowls that are going to contribute significantly to yield and profit. And we need to terminate our, we need to time our termination of our insecticides and other things based on our last money bowls and get our harvest stage out so we can get the pickers in the field in the middle of September so we can get our cotton crop out in a timely fashion. All right, let's look more about, um, uh, variety selection and and look at kind of an overall strategy. You know, our, our uh, recommendation is to look at about 10, maybe 15 percent of your acres and new varieties. You know, we've got, uh, you know, some Bogard 3 varieties that are coming along. Uh, yeah, I think Gus is going to talk about the need to switch to Bogard 3 varieties. So we need to be looking at those. And then varieties that do good in our first year program, graduate those to our second year program. We've got some acres that we need to budget toward those, but really two thirds of your farm needs to be in varieties that you know how they're gonna work for you. And those are the ones we need to go with. When do we plant? Our recommendation is a 68 degree temperature mid morning, so 10 o'clock in the morning at our planting depth for three days in a row. And on top of that, I like to have a favorable five-day forecast. And the best thing, you know, the thing I like to use is looking at heat units five days after we put a planter in the field. And I really like to have at least 25 heat units after after planting for that to happen. But you know, um, you know, I've heard Gus say many times that you know our recommendations are not carved in stone. That's a place to get us started. And I think this really fits well when we're trying to figure out when to get the planter in the field in April. But kind of sometimes when we get into May, sometimes we just got to pull our ears back and go. Um, you know, there's um, sometimes we get into a situation we don't know what to do. That was kind of something that happened this year. Most of y'all remember early part of May, we got a cold front come through and it turned off really cold. Well, we planted uh, over in Poinsett County on May the 7th. That's that night is when that cold front come through. It rained that night. It turned off cold. We had zero heat units five days after planting. So I just knew this was going to be a great test to see, you know, what impact zero heat units five days after planting would do to our crop. Man, you know, when we took stand counts, it took a little longer for the cotton to come up. We had over nine, you know, across all 12 varieties, we had over 90% of the seed we planted in the field come up. It's just unbelievable. Look at our yields. We had some of the best yields in, uh, in Poinsett County. So, so again, you know, we got to, there's a lot of things going on. I think really our saving grace on that cold front, it came through, it rained at night, our humidity dropped down, it pushed all the clouds, all the moisture out. And so our sun come out. It was, we had really cold winds, but on that dark, wet soil, it soaked that sunshine up. And, and I didn't have any soil, soil temperature uh, data that we collected out there, but I really felt like our soil temperature data was really a good bit above our air temperature. And I think that's what saved us on that. So anyway, we got to, you just got to roll with the flow and, 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 you know, just like you know, in agriculture, there's not many things that look like the picture in the book. And it's certainly one of those that, that did not look like the picture in the book and what our recommendations say sometimes. When we look at plant population, I think uh, this pretty well covers the gamut for most people with a seed drop from uh, 32,000 up to about a 49,000 seed drop per acre when we plant. So when we planted that test in, in uh, Poinsett County with Jesse Fly and Marty White, uh, the field uh, we, were, we were in was going to be in a stone of 49.90. And so Jesse is, you know, had the planter locked in. He was dropping a 36,000 uh, seed rate. So we 
we thought, you know, working with Jeffrey, Jeffrey wanted to, and Jesse wanted to look at a 32 uh, C drop and a 40 C drop. And again, you know, the 32 gets us, you know, with 85% germination, give us about two plants per foot of roll. And uh, the 36 is about two and a quarter and the 40 about two and a half plants a foot of roll with an 85% germination. So look at, you know, look at our yield, look at our plant population at harvest. We went out there after, you know, behind the picker and did some stand counts. And, and these are the stand counts we ended up with. And it worked out to be right at 85% of the seed we planted in the field or plants that we harvested at the end of the year. Not a bit of difference in, in, in lent yield. So if we look at dropping from a, a 40,000 to 32,000 seed drop, that's a 20% reduction in the seed and, and, and no difference in the yield, no statistical difference in the, any of those. So where do we go to get our variety test information? Uh, Dr. Borland puts together the Arkansas uh, variety test publication. It's available online. And uh, also in that is, is part of our county production. You know, we include all of our counties in, in, our, in our large block county trials. Here we got a picture of uh, Craig Allen. And this, you can tell this is dated a little bit. I got a picture of Mike Hamilton back when he used to, when he used to be a county agent and had to work for a living. Um, here, when we look at 2020, uh, what we had, we had 12 different varieties across multiple locations. And what I did, uh, all, you know, all the locations that, that we had, all 12 of those, we looked at the ranking. And then over on the, on the right side, we uh, ranked those with, uh, with our average ranking. And so we see um, that, that um, Delta Pine 2012, when we go across here, had the lowest average ranking of 3.67. So that's why it's on top. So the ranking as the, the average ranking goes up, uh, we, we move down. And we also looked at loan value and uh, income per acre. So when we just look at those numbers, here uh, again is, is the average ranking across all locations and the yields that go with that. I think it's interesting that the, the Diner Girl, the 3456, had a higher yield. It had the, the highest yield of all the varieties we looked at, but it was a little more variable in different locations uh, than the, the 2012, so it had a ha little bit higher average ranking. But but look at the, the difference in, in lint yield, especially if you look at the top five or like look at the top 10, there's very little difference in, in lint yield. And we come over, we look at uh, our loan value with, with, uh, with a program from Cotton Incorporated, uh, uh, the loan rate, uh, the loan rate calculator. Uh, we took loan, the loan rate times the lint yield and come up with um, the income per acre. And, uh, you know, from the top variety down, especially these top 10, there's only about $50 difference in an acre. So these varieties are all really tight. So these, these all these varieties are, are really pretty good. Uh, the 2012, you know, the thing, the thing I like about that, it's pretty early mature variety, uh, kind of, you know, one to get in and get planted early and go on. Um, the class of, you know, talked about the 3456 looking good, visit with Frank, uh, Frank grows the other day and, and they were doing, had a lot of their seed production in Texas, uh, had a cold front come through real early and uh, the, the cotton, they, their seed production kind of took it on the chin with a, with a lot of immature. So I think their seed supply is going to be pretty tight. The 2020, that's a variety. I really like the way it looked all season long. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's one that I think fits a lot of places. The 2038, I really feel like is is a little bit later than the Delta Pine 1646. Um, and, you know, when we planted it early and got it in, I think it did well. I, it just seemed like to me it was a little more variable than the 1646. The Stoneville 4550, it's a, it's a, a pretty forgiving variety. It kind of reminds me kind of some things like a Delta Pine 50 because Delta Pine 50 was a pretty forgiving variety. Uh, you know, I really like that, but it, it, again, it's not, it's not a extend flex cotton and some people are really wanting an extend flex cotton. The next gen 4936 is very responsive to picks. In fact, there's a lot of places I felt like if we had a little more plant that we might've done a little bit better on yield. I really think that, you know, if I was looking at uh, a set of varieties I was going to put behind peanuts, that 4936 might be one that I'd kind of look in there. You know, when you come down here to the bottom, you know, again, there's not a lot of difference from the top to the bottom, but the 4990, look at the Phytogen 400 right above that. Those are two varieties, especially the 4990. 
uh, when I look at that in farmer fields and visit with consultants, visit with growers, and when that variety was managed, managed picks and otherwise uh, for the 49.90, I think I think it looked better than what kind of what we're seeing right here. Uh, again, a lot of these tests are in a field of 1646, and we had 1646 picks on it. And I think that's a little too much picks for some of these varieties. You know, we can switch over to Dr. Borland's test. Again, that's another thing he talks about that all the varieties are a winner. Is they, they have to win a lot of tests to get this far along. And so, you know, Dr. Borland's uh, primary focus is on, uh, you know, how do, how do these varieties perform in Arkansas? And so how do they differ? How do these varieties differ? You know, the main thing we're going to be looking at today in this presentation is the difference in transgenics and kind of how they've evolved over time. And then, and then looking mostly at yield. So if we look at, again, uh, his uh, cotton variety test information, see where that's available online, I encourage you all to, to look at that. How, how these varieties changed over time. We see, you know, we go back, here's 11 years of data on this slide. In 2010, we were real heavy into Bogart II Roundup Flex, and we kind of kind of got out of that. It got to where it was pretty hard to grow cotton in Arkansas if we couldn't spray uh, glufosinate over the top. And you can see with uh, the Extend Flex varieties were uh, still have a uh, pretty high reliance on the Bogart twos, uh, but you know the the Bogart threes are are really really coming along, and and we're seeing more acres of those planted. I think we're going to continue to see a big shift. We look at twin link, um, uh, the BT genes in that. When we look at two gene versus three gene, um, you know we see kind of the the shift that we're making in in those three gene varieties. Wide strike, you know. Yeah, not not looking at any wide strike, and in about 10% of our acres are in wide strike three uh, this year. You know, we look at at how our dominant varieties have changed over time. Uh, I went in, and you know, starting at 2013, our top variety was was uh, was Phytogen 1944. It's kind of it was kind of the last year that it was on rank number one and rank number two, and in 14, it kind of dropped off the scale. When we step down and look at at Stonewall 4946, you know, it really jumped out of there. It wasn't in the in 2013. It wasn't even in the top five, but it jumped up to number one, and that was a pretty dominant variety for a long time. And, it, and then it, it, you know, the, the varieties they come and go pretty fast nowadays. The next variety, uh, our number one variety, you know, came on board. It's a class of 15s. First year we planted it was in uh, 15. It was the fourth most widely planted variety. And it rode in that number one spot for about three years and, and is starting to drop off. And I think the, the fate of the Bogart two varieties are gonna, gonna tell the tale on that one. Our next number one variety was the 1646. And you know, our seed supply was really low on, in uh, you know, when when that came out in a class of 16, so we didn't have very many acres of that. And then we then we saw that, you know, they told us that that variety was too late for us and we found it. It's 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 a lot earlier than that 46 number on the end uh, indicates and it's been a good variety for us. Looking at uh, another variety, you know, the 1725 has been one you know, early mature variety that fits really good for a lot of people. But again, I think our Bogart two varieties are kind of the days, the days are numbered on those and we'll be shifting to the Bogart three varieties. So if we look at the at the top varieties that were planted in Arkansas, the top five varieties accounted for about 82% of the acres in Arkansas. Um, see kind of where their yields were in Dr. Borland's test. Uh, 1646, um, there's 51 varieties in his testing program. It came in number 21. We all know that, you know, 1646, if we do the right things on that, uh, that it's got a top end that it's really well. And, and you know, with, with 51 varieties, it's hard to do. You know, you can't do everything perfect for every variety. And that's kind of kind of a reflection on, on how that variety will fall out if, um, if we don't do everything right. So it's really important to get on top of it with picks and stay on top of it and kind of see where some of the other varieties are. Because 1725, it's one that's always done really well in Dr. Boylan's program. It's a pretty early mature variety. And we just kind of see where some of these other varieties fall. When you go in and look at Dr. Borland's data, you know, remember that, you know, our, our more sandy locations up at Manila, clays are heavier soil. Uh, if we're needing uh, to look at how varieties compare to one another in, in a Burke Wilt situation, Jet Hill is a good place to go. You know, as we move further south, get into Mariana, kind of a uh, mid part of the state uh, is, is our location there in southeast Arkansas uh, down at Roar, uh, you know, as our as our 
growing season gets a little longer as we move down south. If we look at Dr. Borland's testing program and, and look at all the varieties that, you know, the varieties, the top varieties that he has two year data on, again, uh, the number one variety is 1725, uh, number two is um, the Phytogen 400, the 4550, and the 2012. You know, those all, those four varieties, the thing they have in common, they're pretty early maturing varieties. So, so it looks like the early maturing varieties are the ones that maybe do a little bit better in his test. Uh, Dr. Borland doesn't have two-year data on the 2020. Uh, we see here's where the 2038 come in and see kind of how they, they, they line out with, with the other varieties. But we've talked about uh, a lot of these here just, just a few minutes ago. So if we look at, at varieties that are worth a look, you know, the, the Dynagro, the 3456, I don't think there's going to be very, many, very much seed supply, but that's certainly one that, that deserves a look. Uh, we got the 3550 uh, or the 3535 that, that's up in that category. The 3729 has kind of been one that's been kind of, you know, then, you know, looks pretty good for us in a lot of places. The Stoneville 4990, you know, last year was the first year I really had a good look at that. It's a real showy variety. And uh, I think, you know, when we manage the 4990 for 4990, not 1646, I think it's, it's going to be a better mature, a better looking variety for us. Talked about the 4936 where I'd like to place it. The 4550 is a pretty forgiving variety. I tell you what, if I've got nematodes, you know, the the phytogen 400 is is going to be certainly real high on my list. If you look at this year's uh, variety test at the county location in Ashley County, he had heavy heavy um, uh, reniform pressure. The 3990 was the top variety down there. And when I visit with some of the phytogen people, when they have heavy nematode pressures, the 3990 will outdo the 400. But most of the time, the 400 is going to outdo the 3990. But and I worked with a grower in Lone Oak County this year that uh, had uh, in 18, he planted soybeans. His nematodes are so bad, I think he only cut about 20, 20 bushels. Uh, last year in 2020, he planted phytogen 400, uh, made uh, 12 and a half uh, uh, on, on, his, on his cotton, so really pleased with that. Um, got some a couple early maturing varieties here to look at. Um, and again, with um, uh, the kind of the old standby, and I really feel like we're probably still going to be uh, a lot of 1646 planted in Arkansas. But again, uh, this Bogard two thing is something that, that we need to think about uh, looking at shifting away from and going to the Bogard three. The UA222 is certainly, if I'm planting a conventional variety, that's going to be pretty high on my list on, on what to plant. So to wrap up for variety selection, you know, we, we need to have four or five proven varieties it's from early maturing to later maturing to spread our risk and maturity across the farm. Plant the new varieties, look at those on about 10 to 15 percent of the farm. And, uh, you know, we've got to plant some early maturing varieties uh, on the front end so we can try to have a picker in the field mid-September so we can try to get out of the field. And again, go to the website, look at Dr. Borland's data, look at the county data and, and give that a study that that fits for your particular location uh, instances. And, and look at some of the variety tests from across the river. Uh, you know, there's excellent data come out of, uh, out of, out of Tennessee, out of Missouri, out of Mississippi, that, that we can kind of look for, you know, if we're kind of close just across the river, that we can look at some of that data and get a good indication of what's going on. So with that, I appreciate your attention and I hope you enjoy our virtual cotton production meeting. And, and with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Well, I thought that was an excellent presentation, <laughs> but uh, I, I do wish that that I'd caught myself when I talked about the the FM 1944. I said phytogen. That's Fibermax. <laughs> but anyway, um, again, um, uh, I'd like to remind everyone to use the the Q and A box to submit any questions we might have about our researcher here and today. And after all the presentations conclude, our presenters will be on hand to answer your questions. So, so up next is Matt Fryer, our Extension Soil Health Educator, to discuss fertility. And while we're getting switched to that, I'd, I'd like to, to note that um, Dr. Borland, we, we updated some of his information on the variety testing website. So uh, up until today, we just had his yield information, but we got his whole data set up now. So uh, next up is Matt. Well, I'm excited to be with you today to present some data collected by Drs. Wilson and Mozafari uh, in cotton. 
uh, fertility work. And so my name is Matt Fryer. I'm soils instructor for the University of Arkansas System Division of Ag. And so just moving right into just some basic soil fertility 101. I wanted to touch on this just to remind us uh, of some things that we can sometimes forget, uh, but that all play a big role in, in our production practices. So the first thing I'd say is that our recommendations are built are made on a build and maintain philosophy. And so what that means is we're going to maintain our current soil test levels by replacing what the crops are moving in the harvested portion. And then we're going to add a little extra to that uh, to, to build lower soil test levels to an optimal level where we expect uh, crop yields to be maximized. And so something else I'd like to point out is that in general, as soil test levels increase, regardless of the nutrient, whether it's phosphorus or potassium, the magnitude of yield response and the frequency of yield responses decreases as well. And so that, that all makes sense that our soil test levels go up, so do our yields. And there's always a law of diminishing returns and it applies to fer soil fertility as well. And so you get more bang for your buck for that first amount of fertilizer applied. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you apply 50 pounds of potash, it may give you a 10 bushel yield return for that application. But the next 50 pounds may only give you a five bushel or a two bushel yield return. And so I always like to use food analogies. And um, so that second and third hamburger is never as good as the first one. And so just remember that when we're making decisions in tight years uh, where we, we can't afford to put out everything um, that's needed. Um, the next point is very cr crucial, but is often forgotten, is that most nutrients are taken up via water or mass flow. And so if water is not present in the soil, a lot of our soil nutrients that our plants need are not going to be taken up. And so just keep that in mind. I wanted to show this as well. This is just the um, amount of nutrients removed in our harvested portion of, of the cotton cotton plant. And so just want to direct your attention to this second or the last and second to last column here at the bottom. Total pounds of P205 removed in a 3,000 pound cotton crop is about 33 pounds of P205. And that's, uh, that's not pounds of fertilizer, but P205 and K2O. The amount of K2O is about 36 pounds removed. And so when we look at our U of A fertilizer recommendations, we have uh, phosphorus on top of the table, potassium recommendations on the bottom. And this first column here is going to be our very low soil test levels, then low, medium, and then optimum and above optimum in the last column. And so you can see when you look at our soil test potassium, we have an optimal uh recommendation at the optimal soil test level it's a it's a small recommendation but that is just to replace what the crops are moving to maintain our soil test levels at that optimal level and so moving into some of the data uh, this is a large table a lot of numbers <clears throat> and uh, the the following few slides will look similar and so i'm going to take some time to set this up and to kind of simplify things. So the first column is going to be our fertilizer rate. In this case, it's going to be P205 for this slide and the next. Um, and then the sites are across the top with uh, our yields and pounds per acre. And then the third to last column is going to be our p-value. And so this number is important because it tells us um, how confident we are that we can reproduce the results of this of this study or, or how confident we are in the numbers that this study gave us and so the smaller the number the more confident we are and so if this number was 0 0.01 we would be 99 percent confident that we can reproduce this um, and that that this is what's going to happen 99 percent of the time and so the next point i want to bring out is uh this last second to last uh, row is going to be our soil test level AO, VL, M, and L, all those stand for our very low, low, medium, optimal, and above optimal soil test categories. 
And so again, just just uh, to state the obvious, in our very low and low soil test categories, we expect to see yield increases. When we get to that medium category, our ex expectancy to see, see that yield response greatly diminishes, and we don't really expect to see anything in the optimum and above optimal categories. And then we have soil pH on the last row. And so you can see that these columns that are in bold are going to be the sites that we had strong, significant yield responses. And you can see that it, about half the time here it correlates to our very low and low soil test categories. And so um, that yield difference is looking to be about 500 pounds, depending on um, depending on the phosphorus rate. Great, even greater uh, at really high rates that aren't usually applied. And so when we look at uh, the same studies uh, for 2019, um, same table set up the same way, even at our low and very low sites, uh, we're not seeing any statistical yield responses uh, to phosphorus. I want to move on to looking at the potassium studies. Um, table set up the same, except we have an extra row here with LSD and those numbers tell us the least significant difference. So um, at this site here, the second column, uh, the least significant difference for a treatment to be different than another is 168 pounds of sea cotton. And so you can just kind of look and see that from our zero K2O rates to our uh, 50, we've got significant responses at every site. And then at two out of three from our 50 to 100, we have a significant response, a uh, significant increase. And so um, all of our low and very low sites in 17 and 18 showed us positive yield responses. And that's what we would expect at these soil test levels. But when you look at 2019, um, we've got um, a medium site that, that could have showed a positive response but didn't. But the again, the, the low soil test potassium sites showed us positive yield responses. Um, and so pretty drastic yield increases. As you can see, when you look at the Longman Cotton Station, one site in the second column from zero to 50, uh, nearly a thousand pound increase in yield. And then it is a definitely significantly increased from 50 to 100. And again, at, uh, at one of the sites, um, we don't see that significant yield jump from 50 to 100, uh, but we certainly see it from zero to 50 at all these low testing sites. And so when you, when you graph this information um, for the potassium sites, uh, when you graph the plots that receive no fertilizer and compare it to the highest yielding plots in the study, this is what you get. We've got on this vertical axis is our relative grain yield. And so this is um, the yield relative to the highest yielding plot. And then we have our soil test potassium level on the x-axis. And so as you can see, like I said earlier, as soil test levels increase, the magnitude of response decreases. So with no fertilizer applied, when we get over here above 130, most of these sites are around 90 to 100 percent of the of their potential in grain yield. But then we always have sites like this down here around this 150. You can see that point there close to that 150 ppm and it makes us scratch our head why is that site only giving us about 80 percent of its potential when it's in an optimal or above optimal category for potassium and i think uh you know if you've been around long enough you've seen potassium deficiency symptoms in cotton and sometimes you've seen it and fields that have soil test levels that are, again, optimal or above optimal, like that data point showed us in that graph, um, where we've got, where our soil test tells us we have enough potassium, uh, but in season our crop tells us otherwise, or where we've applied the recommended rate pre-plant, but we're still seeing deficiency symptoms. And so it makes us scratch our head and, and ask what's going on. And um, I really think what's going on is, is the fact that soils are complex and 
this whole presentation thus far, we've talked about the chemical aspects of soil, the nutrients, uh, cation exchange capacity, the soil pH, but we've failed to neglect or failed to mention the physical properties and the biological properties. And nearly all of us have been introduced somewhat to the physical properties. We, we know about compaction and bulk density, but we sometimes get confused. We may not be able to connect the dots on, well, what does that mean for my field? What, what does that have to do with anything? And then I think even fewer of us are well versed with the bio, biology, uh, the, the biological parts of the soil. And, and rightly so, they're, they're very complex and they're very volatile. Um, and, and what they, what information they can give us, the, their lifespan is very short of the, a lot of microbes in the soil. And, and so it's really hard to, to gauge and learn anything relative to our crop yield responses from the biological side of things. But one thing's for certain is that we cannot improve our soil physical properties without the biological, without those soil microbes and living roots growing in the soil to create those glues that hold the soil together and improve water infiltration and reduce bulk density. And we know that all this is connected. Chemical properties affect the biological because many microorganisms can't live at certain uh, nutrient or certain uh, soil pHs. And, um, and we know that the physical properties affect chemical properties. And so, like I said earlier, nutrients are taken up by the plant and water, most nutrients. And so if, if we don't have water infiltration past six inches, then we don't have nutrient uptake past six inches. And I think that's really the situation um, that, that we have when we have potassium deficiency symptoms in season in a field that has above optimal soil test levels or has had the recommended rate of fertilizer applied. And so take a look at your field when you're irrigating in season. Um, if you don't have water wicking up at the top of your beds, if uh, if your furrows are slicking over and water's running out the end of the field, go dig a hole and see how deep your water's soaking in the ground. If it's only going four to six inches to that hard pan, then uh, most of your roots are only that deep. And so I think we're really handcuffing our uh, crop when when we don't uh, manage for soil physical properties as well. And there's things that you can do to improve that and uh, cover crops and, and different different uh, management systems, uh, no-till, and um, it's all, you know, it has to all be included when we when we try to manage our systems. We've got to realize that soil is a system. It's not just the chemical. It's not just our routine soil test. There's more to, to the system, and we can manage for it. And so you really have two options. You can either manage for it, or you can continue to spoon feed in season, uh, and some are successful at doing that, and if you are, then then, then keep doing it, but um, but some of the some of the research is shown here uh, by Dr. Wilson Mozafari that um, at some sites we see yield increases, at others we don't. And so in this graph bar graph, we've got seed yield on the left, seed cotton yield, and then our site on the x-axis. And so these sites um, had pre-plant all had pre-plant fertilizer applied, and then. Uh, an additional 60 pounds applied after squaring and before first flower. And so you can see some sites had significant yield responses as indicated by the asterisks and then other sites um, indicated by the NS um, were not significant. And so we can see some yield increases to in season applications, especially in in fields where our root system is limited, our hard pans there at four inches, water's not soaking in the ground. This is another study, um, a four-year study at, at one location that Dr. Bill Robertson and Amanda Free uh, conducted in Poinsett County. And they did a little bit different uh, applications where they had a early timing, which was at four to six leaf cotton, where they applied potash and then they applied a late application at um, about a week before first flower. And then they compared that to pre-plant only application. And so they didn't have any statistical differences at this site among years, um, but the, the trend is, is toward um, increased yields when we spoon feed in this conventional till um, system where we're not managing for 
for the other properties of our souls. So just in conclusion, um, phosphorus deficiencies are rare, except in soils that are very low in phosphorus. And so I think that's that's pretty well known. Um, next is a, a positive potassium fertilizer responses um, are probable if uh, we have less than 100 parts per million potassium in our soils. And so, and so that's a key thing to remember, especially if we've got Again, limited root systems. Um, in season K applications can increase yield at some sites. And just like I've been saying, um, soil health factors, managing for physical and biological properties. Um, look at where your water is going. That can tell us a lot about, um, about the nutrient status, potential nutrient status of our crop in season and what's going to happen. Here's my contact information in case uh, you've got some questions that we don't get to. Uh, before we finish up here today, but uh, thanks for your time and uh, hope it was beneficial. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, I want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, please add those to the Q&A box. Uh, we had one question that, that I'll go ahead and address. Uh, you know, this program is being recorded and uh, it's going to be posted on the same website with a extension where, where you registered for this particular program and for the other uh, programs. But again, uh, go ahead and, and submit your questions. Uh, next on the agenda is Dr. Tom Barber. Uh, he's the Extension Weed Specialist. Tom will discuss weed management in cotton. Hello, this is Tom Barber, Extension Weed Scientist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Uh, today, as a part of our cotton winter production meeting series, I'm gonna be talking to you about cotton weed control and some different programs that may be beneficial on your farm and help in managing many different weeds, but mainly Palmer amaranth is what I'm gonna be talking about today. And if we look at Palmer amaranth, over the last several years, we've gained resistance in that weed, particular weed species to several different herbicide modes of action. And I've got them lifted, listed here on the left-hand side. Our, our DNAs are yellow herbicides, such as Prowtreflan, ALS herbicides, glyphosate, uh, in 2010, we had widespread glyphosate resistance across the state, and that has continued for the last 10 years. Uh, more recently, uh, since 2015, PPO resistance has increased across the state, and you can see the spread in the map to the right with these red shaded counties. Uh, in those counties, we have confirmed PPO resistance. So herbicides such as Flexstar or Femesifen, uh, Sharp and Valor, et cetera, those are PPO herbicides. Uh, Matolachlor in the same map where we have the county shaded in black. Uh, in those counties, we have identified populations of Palmer that are resistant to Matolachlor or group the group 15 class of chemistry. So uh, that's a little more recent. In addition, um, we use most of these herbicides in corn, but the HPPDs here shaded in blue. Uh, post tolerance, we've identified in several counties in the map on top and to the right where the counties are shaded in blue, those populations have, by, have been identified to be more tolerant from a post-emergence standpoint to our HPPD herbicides. Now recently, this past summer, I uh, got several calls from growers and consultants in Northeast Arkansas, went to a few fields and collected some pigweed seed. And uh, currently we have three populations growing in our greenhouse at Fayetteville uh, with our uh, weed team uh, folks in Fayetteville taking care and doing some screening on those populations. But uh, these pictures are Palmer anth, uh, one particular population of Palmer amaranth in response to glufosinate or Liberty. And if you look across the bottom, uh, it's just a rate titration of Liberty rates from 16 ounces to 32 ounces, which we'd consider a standard fill rate, all the way up to 8X of that or 256 fluid ounces per acre. Um, obviously, we're very concerned about what we see in this particular picture. Number one, at 32 fluid ounces, we didn't kill many of the pigweed in, in the flat, if any, maybe a couple. Uh, however, with an 8x rate of that, we killed a lot, but we still have some survivors. And so uh, we're making another run of these in the greenhouse, so another replication, uh, looking at the to potential tolerance of this and other potential pigweed populations uh, to glufosinate. 
and you'll hear more about that in the future from us. Uh, I think we should, they should have the run sometime uh, by middle of February. So uh, be on the lookout for more information on these particular populations. You know, seeing those results from glufosinate remind me how very important it is to diversify our herbicide system, our production practices. Uh, we need to start now. If you're not starting, it's crucial that you get a game plan together for this next season. Uh, we have very few herbicide modes of action that pigweed has not shown some tolerance to uh, either here or in other states uh, across the U.S. And so knowing that, we also know that we have very few herbicide modes of action that are going to be developed in the very near future. And so within the next five or even six or seven years, we may not see a new herbicide mode of action. Uh, we know FMC has got one for pigweed and, and we look forward to hopefully getting our hands on that at some point in the future. But regardless, cultural practices and non-chemical practices are gonna have to become the foundation of our weed control programs in cotton and other crops. Um, cereal rye, deep tillage, Narrowing our row spacing, that's hard to do in cotton, but it's possible in other crops. Uh, earlier planting dates, again, that one is hard to do in cotton just because cotton looks up come, looking for a place to die. And so uh, the earlier we plant in a cool window, we're not going to have much luck getting a good and keeping a good stand there. But we can sanitize regardless of the crop we grow. We can sanitize our equipment when moving from farm to farm, uh, our equipment yards, our ditches, our turn rows, and prevent see prevent pigweed from going to seed or prevent seed production. Crop rotation is a good uh, cultural practice to key on in, in terms of uh, managing resistant weeds. Optimizing our herbicide application rates, making sure we deliver the right rate to the acre uh, to give us appropriate control. Seed bank management is the biggest one in my opinion out of all of these. I mean, all of these do the same, not the same thing, but they all move towards more seed bank management. And so, we're focusing on not returning Palmer amaranth seed to the soil. Basically, we want to zero out the seed that is falling to the soil each year if possible. And so we know if Palmer has a weakness, it is definitely in seed longevity. And we have data that says, you know, three to four years may be all that a uh, Palmer amaranth seed can survive in the soil. So we need to focus on seed bank management and reduce the numbers going back to the seed bank uh, each year. And to do that, we've uh, started a graduate student project uh, in the fall of 2018 uh, with Roger Farr. He's a master's student. Uh, this particular study was funded by Cotton Incorporated state support monies. Um, but it's just a, a partnership with myself and Dr. Norsworthy and uh, with Roger Farr being the, the primary uh, responsibility agent for this project. But uh, integrating weed management strategies for Palmer amaranth management in Arkansas. And so what we wanted to do, uh, this is a very large study. Uh, it takes about 10 acres uh, each location that we do this, but a zero tolerance platform, again, where we uh, go in and remove Palmer amaranth that have escaped somewhere between 70 and 80 days after planting. Uh, the first year we did it at 77 versus not doing that. So allowing those seed, those plants to go to seed and increase in the seed bank. Uh, within each one of those, we wanna look at deep tillage. So how much effect can running one uh, year of mold bore plow in the fall, about eight inches deep. And so we did that in 2018 versus not doing that. This is not a no-till system. Uh, it's a reduced till system, but we just didn't use the deep tillage uh, in this where we have no-till here. So we're just comparing no deep tillage with deep tillage. Uh, in addition, we put cover crops versus no cover crop within one of those, each one of those factors. So we wanted to see the effect a cover crop may have or not in each particular scenario. So each one of these can be separate, but uh, basically we'll have a zero tolerance where we don't deep till versus where we do. And then within each one of those, we'll either have a cover crop or we won't. And then we break it down further by herbicide and uh, where we don't include a dicamba at planting, uh, approved dicamba formulation at planting, or whether we do. And uh, we know in previous years, we've seen some benefit, especially if we don't get that activating rainfall to use an approved dicamba formulation at planting in our extend crops. 
and just briefly look at some of these data. And again, uh, this is a system that we're not really going to know what's doing the best until we use this uh, or, or evaluate this system for over five years. And so uh, we've only had it in the field for two years. Well, again, we started in the fall of 2018. Uh, but over here, blue bars represent 2019, orange bars represent 2020. Uh, yes, we did rogue or hand weed. No, we did not. And you can see the big effect from hand weeding just in that first year, we had a 63% reduction uh, in the amount of Palmer amaranth plants that emerged uh, throughout the season. What about tillage? We mentioned the mold bore plow, the deep tillage, rolling that uh, soil over, thus burying all the Palmer seed uh, at the top underneath about eight, six to eight inches of soil. Well, where we did it the first year, these blue bars again, and it held to the second year where we did it, we reduced that population of emerged plants 73% just by running a deep tillage event. And this would be something that uh, we might have to do every three or four years if we incorporate this in a program. It's not something we would do every fall in a particular uh, field. What about that dicamba application with our pre-emerge? We put cotteran down as a base for all of our herbicide uh, evaluations that we made within uh, these cultural practices. The first year, and these are blue bars, but they represent 2020, not 2019. In 2019, we didn't see any uh, benefit from uh, Palmer pigweed control, including dicamba at planting, but in 2020 we did. 2019 we didn't, 2020 we did, uh, and the reason we saw it so big in 2020 was because of the dry spell we had shortly after planting. So we went uh, 10 to 14 days without a rainfall and activating rainfall on our cotteran. Uh, we had pigweed that could emerge in that time because we had enough moisture, but we didn't get good activation of that herbicide. In that scenario, dicamba can protect us on pigweed emergence. And so I think it's crucial to have in our extend crop system, uh, more or less an insurance application and nothing else of dicamba up front uh, with our residual controls and where we did not use it, a 525% increase in Palmer amaranth emerge. What about uh, cover crops? And I don't have a slide here comparing cover versus no cover on sheer Palmer emergence. Um, because we didn't see much on that when we average over all the other factors. But what we did see when we look at net profit. So the first year, uh, again, net profit similar regardless of whether we had the cover or not. Because of the drier conditions, I believe, the second year, uh, we saw a, uh, a benefit of having that cover crop in terms of net dollars per acre uh, received over not doing it, which you'll see right here in this orange bar. We know that cover crops can reduce pigweed numbers and increase success of our herbicide programs just based off of several years of evaluation, but it can depend on when you terminate your cover crop. Um, and I know uh, a lot of people will terminate it four weeks or even earlier than that, four to five weeks before planting. I know people that, that will terminate it uh, well after they've planted. And so uh, there's a wide range of, when you look at growers and what they're doing, there's a wide range of management practices there. What I can tell you is if you're doing this for weed control, we need more biomass than what you see here in this particular example where we terminated four weeks ahead of time. And in this scenario, we planted May 1st. So our four week termination was the uh, first week of April, not enough biomass to help us reduce these pigweed numbers that are coming up. Just one more week helped tremendously. And then again, wait until that first week or, or last week of April, first week of May, uh, we have a significant amount of biomass uh, there. One thing else you can tell in this three week photo, there's a lot, still a lot of bare soil there. And so regardless of your termination timing, uh, we still believe it's crucial to include a pre-emerge uh, with either your termination application or at planning uh, in each one of these systems. It's also important to include a non-selective, you know, it could be dicamba. If we're an extend system, it could be gramoxone uh, with that pre-emerge at planning to take care of anything that's up so we don't have to worry about it later on. And just to show you, you know, we talked about population dynamics earlier and pigweed populations, what they may or may not be resistant to. These photos are from Marion, Arkansas, where we have six way resistant Palmer amaranth. Basically everything I talked about earlier, other than the glufosinate resistant is present in this particular field. 
And so all of our data suggests that mixing multiple products has always been nine times out of 10, a better approach regardless of the crop that we're growing here. Uh, but just to show you again, we have some group 15 resistance, so warrant didn't help us much. Uh, Cotteran uh, did a pretty decent job, but it's at a court and that's a little heavy rate for this soil type. We had a lot of cotton injury uh, from the Cotteran there. When we back that down to a pint and a half and use 16 ounces of break, uh, we can do a much better job and get by with a little less injury, I think. And so using multiple products with these multiple resistant pigweed is gonna be crucial in management in the future. And you can see our untreateds and how, how much pigweed population we're dealing with there. And when you look at the data uh, from this two year span uh, at the Marion location, again, quarter cotter in looked pretty good. We got more injury, but by four weeks, a little over 50% control. And all of these at four weeks aren't doing great, but for whatever reason, that break cotter in combination has always pulled through to be towards the top uh, in most of our research. Uh, you, can, you can mix break with other products. And again, this is a two year uh, average of data set. So some years it may be better than others, depending on uh, the environmental conditions, et cetera. But when we look at a cotton technology checklist and what's available, you know, we talk about those pre's, they're gonna be important regardless of the technology that we plant. Uh, we, uh, we've had the ExtendFlex technology that's been planted in the state since 2015. Uh, everybody, I think by this time knows is tolerant to dicamba glyphosate and glufosinate. I know we have a cutoff date in Arkansas at the current time, it's May 25th, but in, including dicamba up front in planting can really help us along and, and give us some insurance uh, against pigweed emergence with our uh, other pre-emerge product. We can use these products post up until that cutoff date and then we can follow those with glyphosate plus glufosinate or glufosinate plus whatever and our group 15 residual. And we've done a good job in all our plots um, managing pigweed in this fashion. In the Enlist technology, you know, the one benefit Enlist gives us, I believe last year was on maybe around approximately 15% of our cotton acres. But one benefit Enlist gives us is we can tank mix a 2,4-D choline Enlist one plus glufosinate and we have two herbicide modes of action post on our pigweed populations. And I'll show you what that, how that can make a difference uh, here in a little bit in terms of control. Uh, it is better, I think, because we get those two modes of action in there, uh, but still timely apps are gonna be key to this success. Nothing changes from a residual standpoint. We still need them at planting, we need them post. Um, the other system that has been around a long time, the, the glytol liberal link twin link uh, plus system, uh, again, this gives us tolerance to just glyphosate and glufosinate from a herbicide standpoint, uh, no 2,4-D, no dicamba tolerance. Uh, but again, you know, for several years we've used this. It would be nice to have another mode of action. Again, going back to some of those early pictures I saw showed uh, with possible tolerance to glufosinate. Any of these systems are going to require labor. I put that one uh, down at the bottom here, but all of them are going to require labor in my opinion. Uh, when we use dicamba up front, I showed you some data earlier from a different study. This is uh, from two locations in 2018. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, break at 16 ounces plus 22 ounces of extend max, four weeks, 80% control is as good as anything we saw, uh, you know, the two years there with those other products. Warren and extend max or extend max by itself. One thing you've got to remember about dicamba is that it does provide good protection against pigweed emergence until you get an activating rainfall. And it's opposite, if you will, of something like cotteran. So once you get the rain, we start losing activity of Extendamax. But once we get that rain, we gain activity of cotteran or break or whatever we're putting in the system with it. And so to me, it's, it's, it's a perfect pair mix to go into uh, our at planting pre-emerge applications. Now for any tank mix with any of these approved dicamba products, you need to uh, look at the website and, and see what is available uh, to mix with them. Enlist system. So uh, again, I mentioned two modes of action post for pigweed. It's the only system that allows us to do that. Uh, untreated here, this is some uh, data from 2020 at Tiller. Here we use Cotter and Caparol at a pint each 
pretty good residual activity overall, had some escapes, followed it up with enlist one plus sequence. Pretty good treatment, cleaned everything up except these taller pigweed. They're still gonna be there. Uh, we still rated them in 14 days following this. They just twist around, bend around and start coming back. When I add liberty to that treatment, I don't have many escapes, very, very few if any. The, uh, but what I do is I injure the cotton a little more and give it a little more burn, turn it a little more shady yellow, but I'm able to clean up the escapes I had here by adding that glufosinate and that's what it brings to the table. Uh, in another scenario where we just use Cotteran Pre followed by Enlist Duo, so that's just the 2,4-D acting on the pigweed in this plot, more escapes because we didn't get as good with the one shot of Cotteran or the Cotteran single application by itself. Um, but where we incorporated Liberty plus Enlist One and Roundup, again, those bigger ones, it, it pretty much took those out. And so we're gonna have less escapes in that scenario. And that's the benefit <clears throat> of having two post-emergence herbicide modes of action in that system. In terms of dicamba regulations for 2021, Need to check the Arkansas State Plant Board website because it could change from the time I'm recording this presentation uh, till you plant your crop or get your seed. So uh, definitely check the website. Basically, the spray date cutoff, Arkansas spray date cutoff stays the same for dicamba at May 25th. One change is inside the Mississippi River levy can use the federal label with the permit, the federal label change. Therefore, this is a change. Still cannot mix it with glyphosate after April 15th. Uh, but again, check my dates on that in case something changes. Must add a volatility reducing agent. This is something new on the federal label this year. Uh, only two at this point are labeled. Again, there may be more, but the vapor grip extra and the centrus. Again, the buffers from last year are gonna stay the same. One change to the federal label buffer is a 240 foot downwind to sensitive areas, and that's a federal label change if none of these other buffer requirements apply to your application. Again, check with individual product labels and plant board websites because uh, these regulations could change prior to the growing season. So to maximize our cotton herbicide performance, we need to win the battle early. And to maximize our pigweed control program, we need to, we need to focus early because it's hard to catch up with pigweed. Once it gets any size, it's hard to kill, and we just start throwing money at it. Two residuals at planting are better than one. We definitely need to include a knockdown at planting, paraquat or dicamba if you're in this extend flex system. Uh, plus break, cotteran, cotteran caparol, cotteran warrant, et cetera. Uh, again, any of those combinations have shown to work fairly good. Mixing two is better than one. Um, adding dicamba where we can. Again, check that. Uh, those are individual product websites for tank mix, mix options. Uh, applying a timely post, small weeds, especially with pigweed is key. Overlay residuals regardless of technology. I think in cotton, more or less, it's gonna take us four applications uh, to get through the season. And lay-by is one of those important applications. Lay-by with diuron plus something, it can be anthem, or Zidua, uh, because they can only be post-directed, uh, can't go over the top with those two. So you can include those in this mix, you can include Liberty in this mix, you can include Roundup in this mix. Um, but, you know, diuron is a unique mode of action for us on pigweed and is very hot on small emerged pigweed. Prickly cider and yellow nut sedge control. You know, I, I get a lot of calls on these every year, probably because we move more to an oxen based system, but uh, and, and dicamba is not that effective with Roundup on it, or Enlist is not quite either, but glufosinate is. So if you have a glufosinate option, Roundup plus glufosinate uh, does a good job. Invoke past the fifth true leaf, and it's the same story for nut sedge. Nut sedge can really drain a cotton crop, especially competition early, and I got a lot of calls on nut sedge the last two years. Uh, it may take two applications, but Roundup plus Liberty is going to be probably the best option, especially in an extreme environment. Roundup by itself is not great. Liberty by itself is not great, but Roundup plus Liberty, two applications does a decent job. Roundup plus Invoke past the fifth true leaf will do a decent job. But again, you wanna get this early 
before the fifth true leaf if you've got a heavy infestation of uh, yellow nut sedge. What about the future? And talk just a little bit. I'll show you one herbicide, uh, LL27 cotton. Uh, soybeans, we've seen some of those grown in the state, but cotton won't be along to probably 2023 or more. Uh, show you some work we're doing with some visual recognition technologies as well. So the one herbicide I want to talk about that you may see uh, potential for burn down is Reviton. At one to three ounces, it's a Typhenacil or a, it's a PPO or a group 14. Very similar to Sharpen, uh, registered for burn down and potentially crop desiccation be 14 day plant back to cotton and it has very little residual. So if you think of it like a Sharpen, it's not gonna be a standalone product. I'd like it going out with Roundup plus 24D or Roundup plus Dicamba uh, plus this. I think it can help us on some of our uh, broadleaf type uh, weeds that we have at burn down. So again, I've only looked at it one year, but uh, you know the, the data shows that it's fairly comparable to Sharpen at this point. Uh, we've evaluated Loyan as a post-direct, and I'm not recommending this, but I just wanted to kind of show you what we're doing moving forward, uh, working with Corteva on some of this. Cotton is fairly tolerant to Loyan, especially once it gets 10 nodes or bigger. And as long as we're not post-directing up the side of the plant, uh, we can do a good job of weed control with very little injury. You can see it flashes these leaves up a little bit sometimes, but overall, we've looked at this now maybe for the last four seasons, and I'm very pleased with the potential, especially with the activity Loyan has on pigweed at a lay-by slash post-direct timing. So more to come on that in the future. Uh, we are evaluating a sea and spray system and have for the last three years. And if you're not familiar with the sea and spray, uh, it has little cameras on it uh, towards the front that identify the weeds uh, and separate it from cotton using uh, basically facial recognition technology. Uh, but once it says it's a weed and it's not cotton, it sprays or doesn't spray through these little nozzles that you see up here. And these are little streaming nozzles, very close together. Uh, and it just, you know, spray a pattern based on where those weeds are present. This particular model, we can also overlay a residual herbicide broadcast if we want to uh, with this back boom here. And what that will look like going, we put dye in when we evaluate this, but Again, uh, you can see where it hit or didn't hit a weed. Sometimes we skip one, but the last three years, the algorithm's gotten a lot better. And so when we make these applications, we're using a non-selective such as Paraquat, plus a, a photosynthetic inhibitor um, such as Caparol, okay? And so uh, you pre-mix those two together, very hot post-emergence on basically any weed or cotton. So we don't wanna get it on cotton. And if you'll just look down the row, these two rows were treated here all the way down. I was very pleased considering, especially at the front with all the Bermuda grass we had, we thought we'd end up killing all the cotton. Now, I won't tell you we didn't kill some, but cotton can compensate for the skips that are left in, in the, you know, the plants that are missing there. Very good job considering uh, the heavy weed pressure we put it through uh, last year. So very pleased at what that may hold in the future. But that's the last thing I want to show today. I want to thank Cotton Incorporated for funding our graduate student project, looking at those cultural practices, because again, I think that that's going to be uh, where we're going to have to be in the future uh, with we controlling most all of our crops. Uh, my contact information is listed here. We're going to have a question and answer session next. And so I just invite you to ask me uh, questions or text me, email me, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can with the answer. All right. Thanks, Tom. That was that was a great presentation. And, and I've gotten a few questions on on my phone and, and online. We'll, I think we'll address those at the end of the program as we're running a little bit behind. Uh, again, you know, we've been holding around 180 folks. I know a lot of people have questions on how many people is attending. Uh, but again, I want to remind you all to keep putting your questions in the Q&A box. Next up is Dr. Travis Foskey. He's our extension plant pathologist. And Travis is going to discuss cotton disease and nematode management. Travis. Hello, my name is Travis Foskey. I'm an extension plant pathologist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Today, we're going to talk about cotton nematodes and their management. And in my opinion, cotton nematodes, probably on a regular basis, an annual basis, um, rob more yield from the Arkansas farmer than any of the other single diseases that we have out there. 
specifically, um, you know, talking about the southern root knot nematode and reniform nematode um, as far as is our most important cotton nematodes um, in the, in the uh, state as well as the Mid-South. And because we're meeting virtual and we don't have a chance to kind of ask questions, I've, I've posed a few questions along the way that, that I've often been asked. And one of them, the first one is, how do I get rid of nematodes? <clears throat> and and the, the simple answer is, you don't. Um, really, it, it's something you live with. It's it's like having uh, high blood pressure. You, you, you tend to manage it by diet or exercise. And, and sometimes you might need some medication with it. But but it's something you live with. You don't just get rid of it at some point in your life. Same thing with nematodes. So I'm first going to talk about nematicides. Oftentimes we leave this to the end and we kind of rush through it, but it's very interesting to me that the number of nematicides that are available now compared to just 10 to 20 years ago. We have a lot of them and I think we need to spend some time to make sure we understand them and, and how they might fit into our production system. They're often used when resistance and rotation options are limited um, or when multiple yield limiting uh, plant parasitic nematodes are in the field. So both root knot and reniform uh, specifically in this case will often think, see uh, nematodes like stunt uh, in a field, but those really aren't uh, yield limiting uh, species. Nematicides in general only provide one year of protection and then by the next year it's gone and, and even after mid-season sometimes they're gone. This is a, a, a nice diagram here talking about some of the nematicides. I'll quickly kind of go through this. Um, we divide nematicides often as fumigants and non-fumigants. Fumigants uh, move through uh, the soil profile as a gas. They're often injected deeper into the soil profile and move upward. Uh, they require different equipment and, and often are expensive or unavailable. Uh, more recently, the non-fumigants have become uh, uh, more common. Uh, there's more options within the non-fumigants and there's basically three different application methods soil applied often in furrow at planting uh, seed applied uh, just on the seed coat or a seed treatment and then a the foliar applied which is almost always used with something like uh, soil applied uh, historically it was used with timic and now we have what is called aglogic same active ingredient aldicarb um, but uh, just a, a different uh, bag, uh, trade name, if you will. Vellum Total, Vellum Prime, and Propulse all have the same uh, active ingredient, which is fluopyram, and this is a SDHI fungicide that has the maticidal activity. So it's really odd to, to see a fungicide uh, have this kind of impact on nematodes, uh, something that I've looked at early on, and, and uh, it does uh, affect their ability to move, which, again, would affect their ability to actually infect the plant. The seed applied materials, Evicta has probably been around the longest uh, since 05. Um, Abamectin, Eris, uh, Thiodocarb, uh, and then Copio are probably the three chemicals. And Copio is actually fluopyram, the same as the active ingredient in the vellum materials. Uh, the biologicals would be Votivo, uh, Bacillus firmus, BioST, Nematicide 100, uh, uh, that's heat killed Burkholderia bacteria. And then Trudemco is actually an SAR type of material, systemic acquired resistance. Um, and it's often been used in, or being looked at now in, in cotton as well as in, in soybean. And uh, we've seen some, some interesting trends with it. And I'll have some uh, uh, information to show you about that. So specifically, I'm gonna talk probably mostly about the seed and soil applied because that's what my program has uh, evaluated over the past few years. <clears throat> Specifically, a little bit more information about the movement, um, about nematicides, uh, especially the uh, non-fumigants. First a property they need is to be water soluble. If they can't mix in with the water, they can't move through the water phase. Uh, just as a comparison, something like copio fluopyram is, is more water soluble than Evicta. Uh, mobility is important, so we've got to move into the soil, and if you bind to a soil particle really quickly, you can't be effective as nematicide. Something like copio is a smaller molecule, although it binds to organic matter, uh, clay particles, uh, it, it doesn't bind as quickly uh, as something like Evicta. So it's a little bit more mobile um, than, than Abamictin. And that's also gonna be affected by soil porosity. So uh, here we have coarse texture soils where we would have uh, more 
typically yield limiting environments for nematicides because usually we'll, we'll have uh, this has lower water holding capacity. And so the nematodes actually move on the water phase on the soil particles. And so if within these soil particles within this air phase here, if there's the, the waters here and the uh, nematicides there, it's going to affect their nobili mobility and their ability to, to migrate towards a root system. Um, and in the fine textured soils, you could imagine that something like the, the mobility is going to be really limited because that nematicide is going to come into contact with a soil particle relatively quickly compared to something coarse. And so it's, it's going to have limited movement. Uh, some of the bacterial uh, materials that actually have to grow and develop uh, may actually do a little bit better in this type of environment compared to the coarse textured soil. So uh, more movement here, less movement here. And finally, water infiltration, which is also going to be affected by soil porosity. Uh, here we'd have a, a greater amount of movement, although it's still limited because these nematicides are being bound by those soil particles or their affinity to bind to them. And, uh, but a little bit greater in the sandy soil. So a lot of times I'll recommend the chemical materials in, in those soils that have a higher porosity than in some of the finer textured soils. Now, typically, these type of soils are, are not really problematic for something like root knot, but they can be problematic for something like reniform. <clears throat> All right, so the uh, uh, goal of nematicide specifically is to uh, reduce uh, nematode infection. And so uh, this is kind of a summary from a multi-state nematicide trial where we looked at uh, uh, basically two seed treatments, two inferrals, and then a combination of those two. So. Um, here, we really don't see any suppression of, of root galling by the seed treatment or the inferral product, but we do see it with the combination product. So it's kind of positive seeing those two together is, is kind of what you need to, to be able to provide suppression. Um, and, and keep in mind that that protection is, is probably, probably within this point here, we have an image that there's galling out here, but that zone of protection is probably somewhere within this range and probably has a little more opportunity to move downward if you have water infiltration to help protect that taproot. And that's that's extremely important in cotton production. With uh, reniform nematodes, we're really trying to uh, reduce the nematode population reproduction. That's the only way we can measure um, how a nematicide is working. And then, uh, so here we have a image here, so several uh, juveniles as well as uh, uh, mixed life stages of the reniform nematode. And we see a similar trend here, uh, not much protection with the seed treatment or the inferro itself, but a little bit more suppression with the uh, seed treatment plus the inferro. So it's not so much uh, which one you're selecting as far as efficacy goes, but having a combination of those uh, provides a little bit more protection. That also did relate in these trials to a more positive uh, yield protection as well. Uh, albeit in, in these studies, the, the greatest amount was about 5% of yield protection with the seed treatment plus the inferral. Here's a trial we had uh, near Manila, Arkansas in 2019, just to show a little bit more local data. Um, the, uh, the galling here, uh, the highest galling was with vellum total, and the lowest was actually the non-treated control. So uh, not uncommon for nematicides for things to work like that. Um, this is based off of uh, about five to eight plants for root system. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, you can't pull up all of them and check the gall and, and plant them back to be able to get a yield. But that's probably what you would need to get a better indication of, of what's going on. But this just gives you an idea of what kind of suppression you're getting. If it's really going to protect it, we should see it uh, based on those few uh, counts. Here we do have the best yield protection uh, with the AgLogic. So that's the Ultimic which has been very consistent, kind of the gold standard. You can see the rest of these kind of fall between uh, above or below that of the, uh, uh, the, the non-treated control. So uh, again, th there's quite a bit of variability within nematicides and, and you have to have multiple studies um, and, and kind of that multi-state trial to get a little bit better idea. It's a little more difficult on some of these single trials. In the greenhouse, we can actually control the nematode environment some of the challenges with the field is that the nematodes are aggregated. And here I can apply a consistent population in a single pot. The disadvantage, it's not the field. Uh, the other advantage is, is remember the, the water infiltration. 
something like Copio Prime actually has a, a very uh, long half-life, and so it actually uh, hangs around into the soil, or, or in this case, the pot longer, um, and, and Evicta has about a 30-day half-life. We're going about 42 days. Uh, Evicta here, you can see, is probably binding up to uh, the soil or seed treatment, uh, seed coat more, and then here we're washing it off, and we're getting that protection or lower nematode reproduction um, actually in, in the greenhouse. Um, based on this, you can see most of these actually did better than the non-treated control, but only Copio Prime being significantly better. Um, and also compared to something like Trunimco, which we didn't see that positive response with it in this case. And, and sometimes we do in the field, but again, these tend to be somewhat variable. So what's some of the limitations with the seed applied to the matocyte? First, toxicity. Uh, Avicta is, is very toxic, actually more toxic than Copio or Nimistrike, which is no longer available, but we did have it in one of our uh, trials, and I just saw, thought I would mention it here. And so only a small amount of, of what is applied on the seed coat actually needs to come off to, to kill a, a lot of nematodes. Uh, the longevity, I mentioned before, Copio uh, lasting um, a, a year or so, depending on the different soil type, there's a lot of variation there. And Evicta about 30 days. So something that's lasting longer um, is, is, is going to be more effective within that zone of protection compared to something that's that's not. <clears throat> uh, that zone of protection is going to de depend on some of those parameters I mentioned before in that earlier slide, uh, the, the mobility of the nematicide, and as well as that water infiltration rate as well. The one other thing that really limits some of the seed treatments uh, that, that all of them have to deal with is, is the amount that comes off the seed coat. Um, I mentioned several of these bind to soil particles. Well, they actually bind to the seed coat as well. So only a, a small portion actually comes off of that seed coat. Now, not much is needed when you have something that's extremely toxic like a Victo or, or Copio, uh, but uh, there, there's a limited amount that comes off. So that does affect that zone of protection. But we're really looking for some protection that ranges about four to six weeks. And again, it's as the, the roots grow out of that zone protection, it's no longer protected. But we do, based on uh, some of our research, have identified that the early season protection is certainly important uh, for uh, late season yield protection. All right, um, another question I often uh, get asked is, is, are nematodes becoming more abundant? Well, one, I think we're doing a better job of sampling. And, and many are taking advantage of some of the free uh, nematode assays that are available through the, the soybean and corn promotion boards. And this is just a general map of, of uh, the, the, uh, the three states here, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, of, of where we can find um, southern root knot nematode. A lot of times this follows a lot of the, the years and years of cotton production within these respective states. A little bit less with reniform, but I will have to say that in uh, my root knot reniform field, sometimes reniform is, is becoming more common. A lot of that's based on biology, uh, but sometimes that's based on uh, the host and, and what's being grown in that field. So let's take a closer look at that. That That's uh, that's what these nematodes are going to follow. So they're, they're increasing based on our uh, uh, crop production system. So root knot uh, can reproduce on cotton, corn, grain, sorghum, and soybean. All of those are susceptible host. Reniform, only cotton and soybean. So the more of, of the production of cotton you have, oftentimes reniform numbers tend to come up, especially in those fine textured soils, the loam soils, and the silt loams. Host plant resistance. So this is the, the next step in, in disease management, uh, the most economical part. Uh, and years ago, we, we didn't have any options. And so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that I think our host plant resistance is actually getting better. These are um, two root system. This one is a susceptible variety. This one is resistant um, that I took at the end of the season for a trial, but uh, really uh, nice contrasting differences there. You can actually see some of the galling here on that main tap root, which is, which is certainly important for um, uh, cotton production. These are the cultivars that are marketed with resistance to the southern root knot nematode. And I may not have everything here, but this is uh, a, certainly a, a good mix <clears throat> of the group. Stoneville, Fibermax, and of course you can see Phytogen is, is the, the, the majority of them. Uh, they've been actually selecting for resistance for a number of years. Um, there's uh, 
multiple genes for resistance, well, basically two genes for resistance, excuse me. Some of them only have a single gene with a single asterisk here. And if they have two, um, two asterisks, then they have a, uh, uh, two genes that are homozygous. The others are, are kind of unknown or, or heterozygous, uh, kind of uh, a variable, still having resistance, but these two genes are, are definitely better uh, than the single gene themselves. And, and for the first time, it's, it's really nice to be able to report that we do have some options for reniform nematodes. And uh, certainly this is something I would, I would certainly look into if I have a field that has a lot of uh, reniform. These two phytogen lines um, actually have a, a better resistance than what we see in some of the other varieties. This is 2020 data from Dr. Terry Wheeler at uh, Texas AgriLife Research in Lubbock. You can see that the, the numbers here with the two phytogen are much lower than the Stoneville or the Delta Pine 1646. I just threw those in kind of as comparison. 2019, this is a little bit more what I would expect out of these two uh, compared to some of the susceptibles. But uh, again, looking at the two-year data, you can see that, that both of these have uh, some resistance to the reniform nematode, uh, which could certainly be helpful in, in managing this particular pest in Arkansas. Also learned at the uh, the Belt by Cotton conferences earlier this month that Delta Pine has uh, two varieties here that are also marketed as having resistance to the reniform nematode. I, I don't have any data with it, uh, but but I do say that a lot of our, our cotton companies uh, do a really good job of, of doing some screening and 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 uh, ensuring that their information is accurate. So uh, certainly would be worth looking into um, if if you have reniform in your field. All right. Uh, one question that I often get asked is, is how many years do I have to grow a resistant variety to finally get rid of myself of, of rid myself of nematodes? Well, I said before that we can never get rid of them, but let's take a look at a particular trial. So this is one, um, this was uh, Davis and Kimmeride in, in 09. And so I just summarized a portion of their, their study, but basically they planted a susceptible cultivar in the same spot for three years and then a moderately resistant cultivar in the same spot for, for three years, actually four years, we'll get to that. And so you can see the susceptible slowly increasing in, in nematode counts over time. This is the southern root knot. And with the moderately resistant uh, up, down, but, but you know, 05, certainly an increase that could be environmental. And then here's what happened in 06, they, they planted a susceptible one. I have moderately resistant here, but that's just the plot. So these were both susceptibles, and you can see those numbers come right back up. So even though we've we've dropped the numbers, dropped the numbers, dropped the numbers, just one season of a susceptible crop can bring those back up. And so think about it growing um, resistant cotton, 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 and planting corn, and, and those numbers come right back up so they, they don't stay down for long. Uh, that's just because of the number cycles uh, and the, uh, the magnitude of reproduction by this the plant parasitic nematodes. So what's the risk of just using a resistant or moderately resistant again and again and again? <clears throat> it's the same problem we have with fungicide resistance. If you use uh, one fungicide, one mode of action again and again and again, the, the possibility of having resistance to that is, is pretty high. And an example of where we're seeing that within uh, nematodes is the soybean cyst nematode in cotton production and uh, soybean production in the Midwest, where over time, the uh, resistance has started to dwindle. It's, it's still somewhat effective, but we can start to see it uh, not being effective as it, as it once was when it was uh, uh, first deployed. All right, so finally, a couple of rotation sequences to kind of consider and what might be going on with the plant parasitic nematodes uh, within that sequence. This is a, a common sequence with uh, some of the folks that are able to incorporate peanut into their production system. So, Southern root knot nematode, no reproduction on, on peanut. And let's say you had a resistant variety for reniform uh, root knot, those numbers are gonna drop something susceptible, maybe it yields better, uh, the yield comes up, but also the nematode counts are gonna come up. And then back again with our, our peanut that drops it down. So that really helps with the root knot. What goes on with the reniform? Uh, again, similar with the, the peanut, it's a non-host. But here it's susceptible, those numbers are going to come up and you have to get back to the peanut to drop those. So the impact from the, the reniform nematode may be less for this cotton uh, compared to this cotton in this sequence. 
finally, um, you know, oftentimes we have a lot of uh, soybean and, and, and corn in, in our rotation sequence. If we could add cotton in some place, uh, that would certainly help with our root knot. It may not help so much with the reniform. Again, these uh, sequences are assuming that you're not utilizing any of the uh, cotton varieties that now have some resistance to the reniform nematode. But um, here, anytime we'd have the corn, the, the nematodes or are, are root knot is going to come back up. But for reniform, it's going back down. So, so the whole point here is that depending on which is your most yield limiting pathogen is, is what you need to do to kind of manage it. Um, and the only way you know what species is, is increasing or decreasing is, is oftentimes if you take a soil sample, especially with the reniform nematode. So is my sequence, uh, rotation sequence having a benefit or is it hurting me? Uh, certainly uh, take advantage of some of the free uh, uh, soil assays uh, to see if uh, your population and what's changing in there. And this is kind of a, um, a long process. You're living with them. So um, how can you manage them over time and, and keep them in, in the lowest population possible? We're never going to get rid of them. Uh, but these are the things now, the different tools we have to be able to manage our, our cotton nematodes. Uh, with soybeans, we do have some varieties that are moderately resistant to resistant that we can we can incorporate. Uh, each year in my program uh, screens some of the more popular varieties that are marketed for resistant. This is just a short list of those in 2019 and 2020. I, I don't have any that I would call resistant in the group fours. And here's some that are moderately resistant in the group fives. I, I really don't like saying something's resistant or moderately resistant because if you say something is resistant, um, it's, it's relative. It's, it's, it's only meaningful compared to something that's susceptible. So when I have that growing in the field, even though I may see some galling, it's going to yield better than something that's susceptible. That's the main point. Uh, saying that uh, uh, I'm going to pick something that's moderate resistant over moderately susceptible, depending on the environment, maybe uh, relatively close. But this is, this is as close as I can get, and this is the galling percentage that I have associated with those. I do think that some of these, uh, they, they were in the resistant. I do think that they're more moderately resistant based off of one or two years of, of data. And you can see some of these are just based off of one year. So I'm kind of being more conservative where I put those. The group fives, we always know that we've had a little bit better source of host plant resistance there. And, and certainly some of these varieties can be useful. This information is also on the uh, uh, row crops uh, website for the University of Arkansas. So if you need this information and you don't see it here uh, or, or get it here, then, then, then get it from that website. With that, I, I hope you found this uh, information about cotton nematodes helpful and informative. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Cotton Incorporated for some of the supporting some of the research here, uh, as well as the University of Arkansas uh, system uh, for, for supporting us as well. So um, again, uh, hope you found it helpful. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Travis. I'm, I'm really glad to see you put some of the varieties in because we do have several varieties from several seed companies that have with an nematode tolerance. And I was really anxious to hear what you said about, you know, how long that reduced number lasts. So appreciate that. Uh, moving on, uh, I think uh, we'll, we're working on our last presentation coming up. We have Dr. Gus Lorenz. He's a distinguished professor and extension entomologist. Uh, Gus is going to discuss insect management, including some of, uh, and for me, especially some of the exciting new technology that's coming down the road. So, Gus. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Gus Lorenz, extension entomologist for the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture, University of Arkansas System. And uh, I'm here today to talk about cotton insect management. And you see my co-authors here, the guys that I work with, Glenn Studebaker, Ben Thrash, Nick Bateman, all had some input into this to this uh, presentation, but uh, they tell me I only got about 20 minutes, so I'm going to get right into it and, and talk about uh, all the stuff that we got going on right now in cotton insect management. So I hope you can see my screen there. Uh, okay. All right, so the first thing is, you know, talking about going into 2021, uh, some of the issues that we got, uh, resistance, uh, we got some trait resistance and some insecticide. We got issues with tobacco thrips and, and hopefully we got a, some solutions for that, plant bug management. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit more about 
bowworms. You know, I've been I've been talking to y'all the last several years about making the transition to Bogard, the three gene uh, BT instead of the two gene, uh, particularly in light of the last couple of years. I think it's time for us to really talk about that some. So the tobacco thrips, we know we got resistance to uh, neonics now, more so than ever. And, and we're currently testing with the, uh, for acephate resistance and, and one of the highest levels of resistance that was shown in the Mid-South this year was at Mariana, Arkansas. So uh, we know we got a problem and, and it's something that we're gonna have to, to deal with. And, you know, acephate is one of uh, the products that we that we use a lot for when we have to make foliar applications for thrips. So that's, and it, because it's cheap and it's effective, but uh, it looks like, you know, it may be, we may be quickly getting to the point where it's not gonna work for us anymore. So something that we need to keep in mind as we go into 2021. The, the exciting thing that I wanna talk about is the, the, the difference that we're seeing with this new Thrive On technology you know, Thrive On is another gene similar to Bogard, Bogard 2, Bogard 3. It's a, it's a gene that uh, gives protection uh, to the cotton plant uh, for thrips and for plant bugs. And, and just to give you an example, this is last year's plots in 2020. And you can see the one on the left. You can see the thrips damaged, the blackened terminal, the, the leaves are messed up, a good indication. And this is right across on the next row over, just one row to the next. And this is with no uh, insecticide seed treatment. This is this is the Thrive On technology and the level of plant but, or uh, thrips control that you get with with this new technology. The reason I'm bringing it up is it's going to have some limited release this year, so some of y'all are going to get the opportunity to look at this technology. But we really like what we're seeing with the thrips, and just to give you an idea of the numbers differences that we see uh, with Thrive On, and this is in the Thrive On, and this is the, the regular conventional uh, cotton, and you can see the number difference. This is down at Tiller on a big large block. We had the opportunity to look at this technology in a large block situation, because you never know what small plots and large blocks are, you know, sometimes when you make that transition, you can see the technology may not be as great, but in this situation, particularly for thrips, you can see, and here's another shot on another plot that we had at Mariana. And I want you to look at the numbers that we're picking up on. This is on five on five uh, plants, but you can see the no trait, both no traits are running around 120 uh, thrips per five plants. And there's the, the two, the traded, neither one of those got treated at that point, uh, obviously but you can see that uh, a, a huge impact on thrips control. And so what I like about this technology is, you know, it's given us a, a, a control and we're not having to make foliar applications. So I, I see this as a, a big plus, but we're saving not only money and application, but, but we're also not spraying the field and, and killing our beneficials and that kind of thing, which can be huge in that situation. Uh, I'm going to uh, change gears to plant bugs. You know, that's our number one pest of cotton in Arkansas and the Mid-South, and it's one that we we really need to concentrate on. And and what I'd like to do is, is talk about the things that we can do to avoid, you know, uh, plant bug issues. And, and first of all is rotating that chemistry. I mean, I, I think that helps more than anything. I know we got a lot of growers out there that want to go with the cheapest product they can find, and, they, and they'll make multiple applications. And and it just doesn't work, the control that you get. And as we go through some of this data, I want you to see what happens where you get good control versus where you don't achieve the, the, the level of control that you need to. But some of the things that we need to do is consider when, we, when we're in those high populations, looking at spray intervals, shortening that interval between applications when we have to. I know guys don't want to spray more than once, you know, every week to 10 days, but sometimes, when the pressure's bad enough, you, you have to do what you have to do. And we continually see the use of diamond in that situation, uh, really helping stretch those applications out between treatments so it can make a, a big difference there. Uh, one of the ways we can avoid big plant bug problems is, is 
planting early, uh, just getting the field planted early and getting it going. You can escape a lot of plant bug problems out there just by planting early. And, and it's shown to save one to two applications a year just by, by getting the cotton planted early and getting it out. And then, you know, using our termination rules, uh, we can cut out some applications. I know every year there's a lot of applications that go out uh, after the fact, you know, when it's too late to do any good. Uh, so paying attention to that, the cutout, the Miller Bug White Flyer 5 plus uh, 250 heat units can, can save you a lot of times one or two applications. Because when we look at performance for tarnished plant bug, you know, it's kind of amazing really uh, what you see is and if you don't pay attention, you know, a lot of times when you're looking at our data, but this is for, this is a, like an eight year study for Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee. And you look across the bottom at all the products that we have there and you see just about everything that, that you would use or consider using. And I want, I want you to concentrate on the level of control that we're seeing across them. Here's transform over on the end. It's, it's given the highest percentage of control. But this is about the best control that we get is about 70, 75% control, even with the better products in here and the, in the tank mixes and that kind of thing. So you can see, you know, if you don't use the right product, a lot of times uh, get less than 50% control, that's just not acceptable. You know, we can't, you can't control plant bugs in a bad situation with that level of control. So choosing the right insecticide and get one that's going to give you the, at least the highest level of control that you can expect to see and not letting plant bugs get away from you uh, can mean a lot. This is just another look at, at the kind of the same thing, but it's a, it's a different data set. But what we're looking at, and this, I know this is a busy slide, but what you got is the number of plant bugs per 10 row feet across the Y axis. And across here, you got most of the products that we currently use for control of plant bugs in, in the Mid-South. And each bar represents a timing. So the blue bar and the red bar are four and seven days after one application. And then the green bar, the purple bar, and the, and the turquoise bar are four, seven, and 11 days after the second application. So when we look at our untreated, what we're seeing here is if my threshold six, look how quickly that plant bug population increases in just a short amount of time to where we're looking at about 65, 66 plant bugs on 10 row feet. Our threshold is six, so we're 10 times threshold at the highest point here, but you can see we're starting out well above threshold at six per 10, and you can see, and as you look across here at all these products that, are, that we're looking at, you know, what I'm looking for are products that are going to keep me as close to that red line or below that red line that I can. And when you look at some of these products, here's a straight pyrethroid, not doing much. It's better than a check, but not much. But, but this is where, you know, when, when you use the wrong insecticide and you don't get the level of control that you need, uh, you're leaving plant bugs out there. You're, you're leaving yield. So, transform and then we know diamond is a growth regulator so it works a little slower so it took a little uh, longer to get started but as you can see in the in the three timings after that it provided a superior level of control particularly compared to all these other products across here so it just gives you an idea of, of insecticide selection and how important it is and not always just going with the cheapest thing out there or something else. So here's a trial in 2020, and, and uh, this is a product that, uh, that, that we're comparing to the untreated check, and you can see it seven days after the first application, not providing any level of control, and there's a few other products, and then when you look out here at the end, you know, you're looking at Transform and Diamond, uh, providing a level of control below that threshold of six per 10 row feet. Uh, so what we did in this, in this trial was we sprayed it, uh, if we went back and scouted it and it was above threshold and we sprayed it again. And so this is what we're looking at here. 
uh, we're well into the season now, and so I've made three applications here on, with this product, and we're 11 days after application for by day, uh, or theme, and or theme plus diamond, and then we're 14 days after application for transform and transform plus diamond. So you can see the range of control, even with some of the products that, uh, that aren't that aren't working as well as the others. So you can see what's working the best and what's not. And this is out seven days after treatment, and I've got four applications now with this product, three applications with the by date and the or theme, uh, and or theme plus diamond. And here's the two applications, seven days after two applications of, of transform. So I'm I'm beginning to see what products are really providing the level of control. And if, and if you watch those three graphs and then you match them up to the ones that were providing the highest level of control, it works out that the yield associated with, with, uh, with these trials are the products that showed the highest level of control and the ones that did not provide a good level of control had a yield decrease. Uh, compared to those products that are working. So it makes a lot of difference on the products that you choose. Here's another one. This is the regional plant bug trial in, in last year. And what we've got is every product that's currently labeled for control and, and uh, for plant bugs. And you can see it's, it's seven days after the first application, our untreated check is running just right at 25 on 10 row feet. And there's our threshold of six per 10. And you can see all these products out there, we're seven days after and we, we don't have control. We're still above threshold for all these products that the bar goes above. If it's close, I feel good about it. But if it's, if it's not even close, like some of these are, then that's telling you that you're not achieving the level of control for plant bugs that you need to. This is seven days after the second application. So we got two applications on this now. Look at my untreated check. I'm running about 70 plant bugs on on 10 row feet. That's a lot. And you can see what products are not providing control and which ones are keeping that, that population level below. This is intense pressure. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have never even seen 10 plant bugs on a, on a row foot. But this is a good indication of, of what it looks like in, in the, in the, when you get plant bugs out of control, it's really hard to keep them under control for any time. Now we go out to 11 days after application and you can see the untreated check is still above 60 and all these products are still well above threshold. And these are the cats that I'm looking for to provide me the level of control. And, and I would tell you that if you're not using these products uh, to help you control plant bugs, then, then you need to rethink it. And, and then the same trend that we saw on the, on the last test uh, the products that provide the highest level of control are the ones that give us the highest level of yield. And so it's important. Now we talked about Thrive On for thrips, but when you look at the data for plant bugs, this is what we saw last year when we compare the, the, the conventionals, the blue bar, the transgenic is the red bar. And, and so we got it unsprayed at one time at, at three per five row feet or six per 10. And then this is double that threshold and then just spraying weekly. And so what I want to point out is the Ligus transgenic uh, all the way across here to 1x, 2x and weekly. Uh, don't have to spray weekly with this technology to get, to get you a good level of yield. And when you compare it to the conventional, we see the trend. Every situation may not be significantly different like it is for totally unsprayed. But still, we see a trend for a yield increase with the Ligus transgenic over the conventional, in, in regardless of, of the, the spray regime. This is last year on a, on a large block trial. And like I said, we, we wanted to look at it in a large block to see if what the trends that we had seen with the technology was holding up. And so this is the number of plant bugs per five row feet. And this is seven days after the fourth application in the no trait. So that would be right here. This is no trait, not sprayed. This is trait, not sprayed. This is trait with treatment when it hit threshold and the same here. 
So when we sprayed this four times, we'd only sprayed this three times. And you see the level of difference as you go across here to show you, to give you an idea of how, how effective this, this uh, technology can be. And this is, this is the same uh, data, but it's looking out over the whole uh, sampling uh, process. And these two upper bars are the, are the uh, traded and no trait, uh, not spray. So when you look across here, you look at the difference, and here's a blip where the, the traded actually had more plant bugs than the untraded. But as you see across the whole deal, considerably less plant bugs in the traded versus the, the no trait. And then down here is the, these two bars down here are, this is the no trait with, with sprays that were made, and you can see when those applications were made three applications on the on the traded and four applications on the untraded and you can see how those populations compared over time and you're seeing a big difference in a lot of cases over here and over here where the traded had considerably less plant bugs regardless of uh, application so most of the time the traded is providing a level of control over the over the year that's what what we really like about this uh, this technology. And when we look at the yield associated with it, there's the trait with local management and the trait with no management, and then no trait with, with treatments, with sprays, and this is no trait with no sprays. And you can see the obvious yield differences between those treatments and, and uh, you know, a good yield response with the trait compared to the no trait. So what I would tell you about this technology, and I hope you, ever, you know, a lot of you get the opportunity to, to, to evaluate this technology this year, but we feel like it provides a pretty good level of control. I think it's going to save you about one to two applications a year, uh, depending on how severe the, the plant bugs are. Overall, when we look at our square retention data, it's just holding squares better. Uh, it just, regardless of how many plant bugs are out there, when you, when you look at square retention, it's really good. I feel like it gives the grower some cushion on those plant bug applications. If you get a wet, you know, a rain or something like that, and you can't get in the field, you can't spray, you got a little cushion there. It gives you some time to make an application when they do get above threshold in the, in the technology. And, it, and it, it just gives you a little more comfort level about spraying and not being, not having to be Johnny on the spot. You know, if you're a few days late on conventional cotton when you got bad plant bugs, it's going to cost you. With this technology, it's going to give you a little time. Uh, what we what we really like is that you know, like we saw with Bogard when it came out, and with with other traits that have come out on the market in in crops, there was a yield drag associated with that technology. But it appears that there is no yield drag with this current technology. It's, uh, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute, but, but certainly the, there, there doesn't appear to be, with the addition of this gene for plant bug and thrips control, there, there is no yield drag associated with it. So we'll be working on this, on this uh, technology because we feel like it, it's given us uh, an opportunity to evaluate our thresholds, you know, uh, is the threshold going to going to be the same with this technology is not and that's what we're going to work really hard on next year the last thing i want to talk about is making the transition to, to three gene we still got a bunch of folks out there that are planting two gene cotton uh, that's what they like and i understand that but we've been looking at this this uh the worm applications that we're having to make on dual gene cotton like bogard two and and, and for a while it was wide strike and, and you know the dual gene there's still a lot of dual gene cotton out there so I want to talk about that and the and the problems that we're having and, and how to get control and that kind of thing but you know bollworms uh, you know if you have to make two applications of, of a foliar insecticide for control of worms you know it really gets in your back pocket quick uh, those those are very expensive applications, and it can cost you a lot of money. So, we looked at a lot of three gene cotton this past season, and and uh, 
it really held up extremely well. And I'll show you some data on that here in just a second. But, you know, part of the problem with the dual gene is there's so much overlap with all the, the cry one AC, which is the common uh, protein that's used in Bogard, Bogard two, White Stripe, White Stripe three, and Bogard. They all got that gene. And, and these are the same genes or pretty close that, that we share uh, with, with corn too. So, but you see some little differences there in the products and the, in the, in the conscript of uh, BT protein that they have, but take it from me, there's just not a lot of difference in these. And if they, if they develop resistance to one, they're going to, they're going to eventually develop resistance to all of them. And that's a concern. And, and certainly, you know, what we saw with the dual gene wide strike was it, it really gave it up quick with that Cry1F. But now all the three genes have the same uh, BT pro protein. It's a, it's a, and, and, and they're also inserting it in corn. And I think that's what our problem is. We're, we're seeing this uh, issue uh, being driven by the corn because the, of the of the BT genes that they've inserted in the corn, and and now it's carrying over into our cotton, and 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 we're beginning to see less and less control with the dual gene cotton. And just over time, just looking at the last few years, it's 18, and when I look at our threshold of six percent, and I'm looking across at all the technology, you got Wide Strike, Wide Strike Three, Twin Link, Twin Link Plus, which is the three gene, Bogard Two and Bogard Three. Uh, what you see is that that dual gene, the wide strike dual gene, in this case, giving it up pretty bad. Now, the blue bar is unsprayed. The orange bar is where we put a 20 ounce shot of Prevathon out there. And even with the 20 ounce of Prevathon in this situation with the with the dual gene wide strike, we're still above threshold. So that just tells you, you know, that that technology, and that's why the company is it's all wide strike three now uh, because of that. This is a regional uh, comparison of, of sprayed, unsprayed. And you, again, this is in 18, and you can see the difference. And when I look across here from the unsprayed to the spray, unsprayed to the spray, whether it's wide strike, wide strike three, twin link, twin link plus, Bogart two and Bogart three, the trend is very obvious for the sprayed component to, to help. So that's telling me that even with the three gene, you know, we're, we're going to be running out of time with this technology uh, if we don't watch out, but we're seeing a significant yield, yield difference with between uh, un, unsprayed and sprayed in some cases. Uh, and it's particularly bad uh, in a lot of these cases, a significant yield uh, difference in those three genes. This is in a, in a pretty heavily infested field, but you can see the obvious trend there is the spray uh, is is helping uh, maintain yield potential. This is 2019 and there's that 6%, that's your threshold. And when we look up across this technology, now we're to the to the three gene with Bogart 2, just looking at it, and there's the unsprayed and there's the sprayed. So you see a, a difference beginning to develop there. And we get a little blip here again with Bogart 3. So it makes me wonder how much how long this technology is going to hold for us. Now, like I said earlier, the three gene held up really good last year, but maybe, you know, I don't know how long it's going to last. That's our concern. And this is 2020 and, and there's the unsprayed Bogard too last year. And a lot of you guys uh, in, in several parts of the state had to make two applications. And, and this may be showing that situation, but you see what we see across here is that all the three gene products are providing a really good level of control and there's really no difference between the sprayed and the unsprayed in that situation. We do see a little bit uh, like a trend for an increased yield though, uh, like we saw earlier in the other earlier graphic, but you can see that, that there's a tendency for spraying to increase yields a little bit the data, uh, the, the worm data doesn't show that, but certainly, uh, you know, there, there's a trend there that, that, that can't be ignored. And then when you make that decision that it's time to treat and, you, and you're going to make an application, 
we start looking at the, the various treatments out here that provide a level of control. And what you see is uh, the diamides like Besiege and Prevathon, which is both of them are chlorantraniloprol. But you can see to get that population below that threshold level, it's only the diamides that are providing that level of control. And so we did a study, we went and took like four trials and we looked at the percent control at, at different rates of products and what you see there. And, and this is why we push this 20 ounce rate of Prevathon or 10 ounce rate of Besiege uh, compared to the lower rates like seven. And people are always looking for a way to, to save a buck. And you can see the level of control with 14 ounces of Prevathon compared to 20 ounces, it's, it's almost as good, but look how it drops off so fast when you get out to about two weeks. That's when the, when the, when the control really falls off with those reduced levels of, of, or application levels going from 20 ounces to 14 ounces can make a heck of a lot of difference in the level of control that you get between the two. So if you want to maintain yield potential, you need to be using these products at the at the label or at the 20 ounce rate like we recommend. And this is looking at, at seven locations in four states and looking at, at the yield, uh, the increased percentage above the untreated check. There's 14 ounces of Prevathon, there's 20 ounces of Prevathon. There's seven ounces, 10 ounces. And then there's your other products, Intrepid and Brigade and Asaphate. Not a lot of difference between that and the 14 ounce there, you know, so, but our thresholds this year as we go into 2021 on the dual gene or regardless of, of the technology, as long as it's a dual gene or less non-BT, uh, we're going to treat when our population reaches eight per hundred or 6% fruit uh, injury of any kind. And then after bloom, that's before bloom, after bloom, then, you know, we're going to treat on that 20 to 25% egg lay or 6% fruit of in, injury of any kind. And, uh, you know, regardless of the size of the larvae, you know, uh, you got to spray. Uh, when those, if we have that big egg lay, we didn't have it so bad this past season, but but if you're treating a, on eggs with a, with a diamide, uh, you know, I would not make an additional applications any sooner than 12 to 14 days uh, making double applications uh, th that quick, like seven, eight, 10 days apart, uh, I think you're just, you're not giving the, the application time to work. So we got, we got to be patient with it after that and, and let the technology and the insecticide work for us. On the three gene stuff, we're going to treat when populations exceed eight larvae per hundred uh, plants or 6% fruit injury, just like in the non BT and the dual gene stuff, but we're not going to make we're not going to make applications based on eggs. We got to see what's going to happen with the with the three gene stuff because it's held up so well for us at this point. And, and just to make I, I told you a little earlier about the yield you know associated with this Thrive on, and we screened a bunch of varieties uh, with the company this year. And we're looking at the yield associated with some of these lines that are coming out with this new technology. And, and there's some, right here's a three gene uh, wide strike. Uh, there's a couple of, a dual gene and a, and a three gene cotton here. That's Delta Pine 1646 and there's 2020. And then out here at the end, you know, you got uh, some, some dual gene and three gene cotton varieties. But I want you to look at the, all these lines of, of the three gene with Thrive on that are yielding uh, as good as anything in the test. And this was in a situation where, uh, you know, there's some plant bugs in the field and, and it, it's a good indication of how much, how much value there is with that technology for plant bug control. But basically we're going to give the three gene stuff a chance to work, to hold for us. Uh, we're going to spray based on eggs, uh, on dual gene. We're going to do all the same things that we've been doing, but we get, we got to give the, the BT, the three gene BT, a chance to work. It held really well for us in 2020. So, uh, but on the two gene, if you're if you're sticking with the dual genes, then you know we're going to target spraying 
early and and uh, catching on, on the eggs if you get that 20 25 percent but but certainly that's that's the strategy for us going in and and you can call me anytime and we can talk about it all you want the question is it time to make the transition to three gene cotton and i think that's a good question uh I, i'm no rocket scientist but i can tell you from my uh, perspective it's high time i think for us to to uh make that transition all right. Thanks, Gus. I really like that graphic. We're not exactly rocket scientists, <laughs> but uh, our goal was to be through with this part of a little after three and we hit that pretty good. But anyway, that again, this concludes our recorded presentation part. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to thank all of our faculty, staff and students for their efforts to improve cotton production in Arkansas. And it's just as important that we thank the Arkansas cotton producers yourself, themselves and the funds that are administered through the cotton board. Uh, the work that we do would not be possible without your support. So we hope that these presentations help demonstrate your checkoff dollars at work. We also uh, want to remind you that CEUs will be submitted after the meeting for those that provided their license number when they registered. Uh, I think maybe some of those on the front end, uh, you were not asked for your license number. So if you registered and you weren't asked for your license number uh, and you want to receive credit for this, please email your information to Jerry Clemens. And his email address is jclemons at uaex.edu. Now, they're not going to submit the credits for these until all of our meetings have been conducted. And, you know, our last one's going to be February the 2nd. So they might sh not show up on your records till maybe toward the end of February. So now we'll begin our Q&A session. We've gotten several questions. Um, if, if you have a question that's, that, that you want to ask, be sure and, and type that in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to, to get to that. But um, to start with, we've had a, a question on carryover seed. And, and Gus, part of this question is for you. I know there's a, a, a consultant asked about a bulk box of carryover seed. And um, I know one thing we'd want, I'd want to do a germination just to make sure our carryover seed was still good. But then their question also, the second part of that had to do with, uh, was, you know, is Evicta treated? Does that need to be retreated again? Or what, what, what do you feel like our insecticide seed treatments are like? So that Evicta, you know, is the nematode and the plant bug component. So I, I defer to, to Travis about, about the nematode part of it, but but certainly, you know, when the, when a product's been out for over a year, uh, there's there's going to be a little bit of, of degradation of that product. Uh, you know, depends on environmental conditions and that kind of thing. But uh, I I prop in my from the insect perspective, I I don't think I would try to treat it again. Okay, Travis, what do you think? Yeah, the, so so I would agree with that. I, I probably, you know, we've had this come up before. As long as it's stored, okay, yeah, you're going to have some loss, but I don't think it's enough that it's going to really, it's not going to be zero. And there's so much of it on that seed um, that it's still going to be effective. But again, I agree with you, Bill. I think a, a germination and a vigor test would be more important to me, especially if it ever froze at some point, you're really going to have some serious issues there. That, that'd that be my major concern for that seed. Yeah. And I know uh, in the past we could send seed to the plant board for the warm jet, for the, the, the standard uh, germination test. Uh, the cool test will also tell you a lot about uh, the quality of the seed. And so uh, our, our state plant board is, has been able to do that in the past. There are other, there are other places to send that. Uh, Gus, while we kind of got you on there, there was a, a question too. You mentioned something about a, a 10 row foot samples that you did in some of the research. And they just want to know, did you just use two drop claws to sample that? Or where, where did you come up with the 10 row foot sampling? Yeah, so the way we sample our plots is we take two shake sheets per plot. And so that would make the, the 10... 10 total row feet. You're doing two and a half on each side for five feet and you do it twice in a plot. So it's a total of 10 row feet 
So instead of three per five, which is our threshold, that would be six per ten, same thing. All right. Sounds good. While you're on the while you're on the horn, Gus, uh looked like there was a lot of really good thrive on varieties that are coming on, especially, you know, compared to some of our standards. You mentioned something about availability of some of the thrive on varieties this this coming season. I uh, had a question on on what, what what can you share with us on availability of those varieties? Yeah, so the, the exciting thing, if you if you hadn't seen it, uh, is that the the Thrive On has uh, USDA and and the EPA have released it, uh, you know, from regulation. Uh, it'll still be a stewarded product because there's a couple of countries out there that won't accept it still, but the good news for us is it'll be non-regulated. So we, we don't have to go through all those hoops about borders and buffers and all that stuff, which is pretty exciting, you know, and, and not having to deal with that part of it. But what the company indicated to me that they plan to do is have a, a, a fairly a good release of the product. I think they, they've targeted like 80 to a hundred growers or something like that, that are going to be, that are going to have the opportunity to look at the product and evaluate it. And, and, uh, and like I mentioned earlier in, in my talk, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty exciting to see how well those varieties perform for us in our trials they really turn to cotton uh, at the end of the season and there's some really good yield there and, there, and there's no yield drag associated with this technology like we've seen in the past with other technology so I think they're making strides in that in that arena. I guess, you know, uh, you know, the Thrive On is, is effective on the, the tobacco thrips like you showed. We just had another question just come in. I wanted to hit you while we're still here. Are you seeing any benefits of uh, over-treating seed with, uh, that has gaucho on it, over-treating that with orthene uh, or, using, or treating orthene in furrow to combat uh, tobacco thrips? What's your thoughts on, on yeah, stacking orthene we, in there? Yeah, although we've seen a little slippage with foliar applications, uh, with asaphate, the seed treatment or the in furrow applications still are doing a great job for thrips control, and that and that's still a viable option. The only problem with uh, the seed treatment part, you know, we used to call that triple treated seed back in the day. Uh, probably nobody here remembers that, but <laughs> me and you. But anyway, so the once you treat that seed with with asaphate you can't if you don't use it you can't take it back you can't turn it back in and so i guess there's always a danger if you treated a bunch of it and then you didn't use it you got nowhere to go with it so but it still works and it's still doing a, a fairly decent job and it's one of the best treatments in my thrips trials every year the asaphate in furrow and even the seed treatment both uh, look pretty good compared to all the other thrips treatments out there. Yeah. You know, we got, we've gotten kind of spoilt here lately, you know, run 12 row planters and the whole thing we're doing is putting seed in. We can cover a lot of acres, but sometimes uh, that leaves us some, some, uh, some holes in our protection program. Uh, I'd like to kind of switch gears a little bit and, and uh, visit and get Matt up. Uh, Matt, I know you and I've talked about, uh, peanuts you know cotton behind peanuts and and we talked about george's recommendation on nitrogen behind peanuts and i mentioned today a variety uh that that i thought would work pretty good uh behind peanuts but what can you share with us your thoughts on what we need to do with nitrogen uh uh following uh pe following peanuts with cotton that's a good question um i'm gonna give you two answers i'm gonna give you a short answer and a long answer Short answer is we don't know. <laughs> we haven't done any um, research in Arkansas on nitrogen and cotton following peanuts. Uh, the long answer is um, a good possibility. Uh, you look at Georgia's recommendation, I think they uh, recommend like a 20 unit credit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then you look at our rice nitrogen recommendations 
and rice following um, following corn or rice following rice or cotton is a 10 to 20 pound of, of nitrogen increase um, compared to rice following soybeans and other legumes. So there is a possibility that that, that could uh, be the case that we can reduce nitrogen rates following peanuts. But I think the main point is that like anything, it's site specific. I would, uh, you know, if you're really interested in doing that, I would do some strip trials on farm and most folks have yield monitors and uh, kind of test it out yourself. Uh, you can do that a lot quicker than we can get out uh, three years of replicated data. So, um, but I would just say, test it out yourself because I, yeah, that's a possibility, but uh, I would be cautious. Yeah. I think, I think we have some consultants that have been in that testing phase for a couple of years. And, and, and I think from what I remember, it seemed like George has said 25% reduction in, in the nitrogen fertility fertilizer rate behind peanuts. And, and it seemed like to me in some of the consultants I've, I've visit with that, that think they have a, pretty good handle on it. It looks like they do too, that, that that kind of fits in with what they're doing. All right. And another question that, you know, kind of shifting gears toward, um, toward the herbicide part, Tom, is I had a question that was texted to me a while ago about, you know, we talked about, you know, viability of pigweed seed. Is there, is there a difference in pigweed viability when it's sitting on the soil surface? So if we're in a no-till situation using cover crops, how long does pigweed seed last on the soil surface as opposed to where if we turn it under with a plow? Well, that's a good question, Bill. I think that, uh, I mean, we know if we bury it deep enough, like six inches or greater, that uh, we, we significantly reduce our germination. So if we're just tilling it to two to three inches, I don't think we're affecting germination uh, of that pigweed one, you know, one way or the other. But but, uh, you know, seed left on top of the soil at the end of the year can be subject to predation from various birds and can be moved off site with water or flooding and spread around. And so uh, there can be some reduction in viability of the, you know, of the seed that's left on the soil surface through just weathering and predation and, uh, you know, various different uh, breakdown mechanisms of the germ. But, but uh, and then, you know, if we till it a little bit, it probably protects a lot of that <laughs> leftover seed yeah. more than if we don't. So I, I think that, um, you know, I don't know that there's a great big difference in the amount of seed that will germinate because we're going to lose some either way, regardless. Um, the big thing is most pigweed is going to germinate either from the soil surface or just, you know, one to maybe two inches deep. And, and so if we can get it deeper than that, we'll probably reduce uh, germination the next year a little bit. Um, when we look at all these, uh, fields that have potential resistance issues, we always, or most, in most cases, we see a spot that's just the result of seed rain from the, uh, mother plant, if you will, the, the year <laughs> before. So, um, you know, if we're seeing fields like that, I mean, we need to, especially in Northeast Arkansas, we need to take action this coming season. All right. So kind of leads right into our next question when we're taking action. Uh, do in a question, I got a couple of questions from Northeast Arkansas. Do generic Liberty, uh, they talked about Interline and Cheetah and other products, work as good as a name brand? And then uh, on these uh, Liberty tolerant resistant populations, would adding uh, AMS to Liberty help, help heat it up a little bit so we could get some control, better control? Yeah, and, and, and so on that, on, on Liberty in general or any glufosinate, I mean, it's a, it's a very finicky herbicide regardless of the, of the formulation. And so if we spray it too early in the morning, too late in the evening, we're going to get less control of Palmer or it's going to have less activity. If the temperatures are cooler than 65 degrees, we're going to get less activity. I think in periods of stress or, or stress on the activity of that herbicide, uh, adding AMS in a lot of those uh, instances can help. Uh, we see the greatest benefit in, in a cooler, more drier environment window of application when, when we add AMS versus when we don't. Now, whether or not, you know, I very rarely, Bill, unless it's earlier in the year, get a significant difference in our, all our data sets by adding AMS. Uh, the other reason to add it would be as a, as a buffer agent if we have uh, hard water or something like that. And so, 
Uh, adding it's not going to hurt anything, number one. I, I think uh, the majority of our glufosinate applications go out with, uh, with AMS in the tank. Uh, in terms of the populations that I discussed in Northeast Arkansas, uh, when I did initial screening on those here at Lone Oak, we did add AMS to the tank. Uh, I have, and, and I used Liberty herbicide when I did my evaluations on those. Um, I have not looked at those particular populations across all the different generic glufosinate herbicides available uh, for those specific populations. Now, I have evaluated all those generics and just a standard glyphosate resistant uh, pigweed population at Mariana over several years. And there, there just generally is not much difference in, in terms of efficacy. We can't get anything to separate. Uh, in terms of cotton injury, we've seen, I think one year we saw more injury maybe with uh, one called Kong, I think. Um, but uh, again, very rarely do we see uh, differences in those glufosinates in efficacy. Okay. Uh, another question from the same neck of the woods. If dicamba is a pride plate pre with break or warrant, can or should we still mix it with paraquat? Well, that's a great question. And, and to me, if we're just after pigweed and you know that's all that's in the field, uh, you know, dicamba, especially on small pigweed, is, is very efficacious on those populations. Uh, if we have a lot of winter annuals, uh, of course, dicamba is good on horseweed. It's really less active on henbit by itself. And so if we've got henbit populations, uh, various other winter annuals, uh, primrose type pop, you know, it may be beneficial to mix a paraquat formulation in with the dicamba at, uh, at burn down if we don't think glyphosate can take care of the remaining weeds in the field, I guess, uh, that, that, uh, that dicamba might miss. And so it's a case by case situation. I'm going to say most of the time, if, if a grower has, has made a good uh, fall, or I'm sorry, spring burn down application, uh, you know, a month or so prior to planting, he's probably not going to have a whole lot in the field uh, that a, a glyphosate plus dicamba can take take care of. So okay. it's a case by case, but with any of those products, and I don't know off the top of my head what's on the list for each individual product right now. So go to the websites, either Ingenia Tank Mix, Google Ingenia Tank Mix, or Extended Max Tank Mix, and uh, make sure you search for the approved product for, for tape mix in that system. Okay. Well, Matt, I want to circle back around to you, and, and this may be more of a, it, it's a comment or a question from our producer, but it's why are fertilizer recommendations for 1,125 pounds instead of 1,250 to 1,500 pounds? And Matt, I know before you started, I came to Arkansas in 95, and, and that's where our our recommendations were but you know when you go back that far you know we we didn't bust you know, a state average over a thousand pounds for a long time and so you know uh, an 1125 pound yield go on a on a fertilizer recommendations back 20 years ago was was a, was a pretty strong yield because we, we weren't that high but but our yields have changed and and i know our state average this last year was 1200 pounds but, you know, when we look at the economics, if you're just producing 1,200 pounds, you're just barely paying your out-of-pocket expenses. And so uh, I know there's some philosophical answers, just some things to think about what our recommendations are for. But have, have you got any, any thought on, on, on do we need to look at changing this or how, how do we adjust? Because, you know, we're, you know 1,125 pounds, we're not making money. What are your thoughts? <laughs> Putting you on the spot here. Sorry, man. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, very, very good question. Um, you know, like you said, state average about 1,200 pounds. Um, we may need to increase those recommendations. Um, but, you know, again, kind of back to my talk, um, our recommendations are based on a build and maintain philosophy. So, uh, we have fertilizer recommendations that cover that 1,100 pound recommendation that we currently have, plus a little bit above it uh, to build soil test levels. And so I really think that that build portion is giving us a little leeway in our, in our yield goals. And so 
even though our recommendations are for a certain yield goal, we are applying a little bit more that that will um, maximize or take care of us when we're in a higher yielding situation. But yeah, I mean, it may we may need to look at that in the future. Okay. Uh, while while you're here, Matt, I know uh, I I help you or you help me or we work together on on a lot of our soil health stuff and 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 just kind of the the interaction between the roots and the root exudates and the, you know the organic matter and and all that and the interaction between them and our and our and our uh, soil microbes, especially, you know, as we get into more of a no-till or fungi to uh, bacteria balance becomes greater in terms of fungi. But how do you feel like the role of the mycorrhizae fungi is in the soil and, and, and how it relates to plant production, you know, as far as nutrient uptake, soil compaction, root enhancement? And, and I'm going to add, uh, uh, well, there's nutrient uptake and, and some things, but what share kind of what you think on that. And, and, and you might and I've heard you talk about this before. How do, how do you relate that to what we see, you know, potassium deficiency symptoms? Because we're seeing potassium deficiency symptoms. I'm, I'm adding to the question, but we're seeing potassium deficiency symptoms way earlier now than, than, we, than we have before. And our soil test values are still pretty high. So th is this related? Yeah, I think it definitely is. You know, I talked about soil health in my presentation and, um, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, in case you don't know, um, it extends the rooting, the roots capacity to uptake nutrients and water. Um, and so that fungi actually penetrates the roots um, and it is kind of like an extension of that rooting system to bring in nutrients and water. And then not to mention when we, um, you know, when we have increased rooting depth from uh, from use of cover crops the previous fall and we're reducing tillage. We're also increasing that the um, environment, uh, a conducive environment for microbiology and all that fungi to form and, and help us and when it comes to soil fertility. And so I think a lot of times, you know, just like our soil tests say that the nutrients are there, but our crop is kind of handcuffed and unable to to pick it up sometimes based on rooting depth and um, moisture movement down and throughout the soil profile. And so, so yeah, I think it all plays a big role. It's all connected. Um, it's just a matter of trying to manage for all these factors um, to help us out in the long run and ultimately economically. Yeah. Cause, Cause I really feel like that helps build soil structure. And then as we develop better soil structure, we have deeper water infiltration. When we have deeper water infiltration, we have deeper effective rooting. And so all those things add to one another. And uh, so yeah. it's, 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 um, it's kind of a complex issue, um, but I think something that, that, that we have to really give a lot more attention to. And I know the cotton supply chain is, is really uh, trying to, to get our industry to go that direction too. And that's, that's, uh, it's a subject for another, for another meeting like this, but you know, you know, the question we had a question a while ago on nitrogen behind peanuts and I would talk, I talk you know, run it by you, uh, Matt, for the fertility guy. But, you know, if we look at our panelist here, um, this is probably by far our best peanut expert, uh, that we have here, Travis, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, nitrogen or cotton behind peanuts? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I, I would agree with Matt, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of variability, but, you know, sometimes guys are just looking for a, a number. And if I'd give you a number, it'd be about 30 pounds to the acre. So that's a starting point or however you want to go with that. But that's, that's something to start working with and how you want to adjust that, depending on your production system. So 30 pounds to the acre. All right. So we should be in around that hundred to, you know, if you look at the data uh, on, you know, kind of where the, the nitrogen peak is it's somewhere between you know 90 to 100 units and and sometimes we bump that because of losses so if we're in around that 100 units that drops us down to about 70 so that that fits your ballpark yeah yeah that's that's where i would be of course again like you know we all know fields are variable but that just gives okay. somebody kind of a reference a starting point and they can kind of 
modify depending on their production system over time. But a lot of biomass, definitely going to have quite a lot more. So. Yeah. And, and I don't think you, you know, and, it, and it's not just cutting back on fertility, uh, picking a variety that's, that's uh, a little more responsive to mepoquat chloride is, is also something in your favor. If you pick a real aggressive variety, then you can really shoot yourself in the foot or both feet if you, if you think about it that way. So, you know, that was, you know, we're talking about mepoquat chloride on here. I've got one question where we talked about mepoquat chloride and, and uh, I would, I really don't know anybody in Arkansas and I would certainly hate to grow cotton without mepoquat chloride. But their question is, is, is it stressing the plant and is there an alternative uh, for that application? Uh, you know, there's, there's some other uh, plant growth regulators that will have a uh, growth inhibitor uh, in, impacts on, on the cotton plant, but I don't know that there's going to be anything that is is cheaper than mepoquat chloride. But, you know, there's there's two components of growth. There's cell division, cell elongation, and mepoquat chloride only impacts cell elongation. But the bottom line is when you put mepoquat chloride on a plant, it decreases elongation of the cells on the above ground portion of the plant as well as the below ground portion of the plant. It just impacts the above ground portion of the plant greater than it does below ground. And so uh, that's something I found. Gus and I were doing some work down around Pine Bluff in, in, in some fields where we had um, nematodes, root knot nematodes, very, very early in the season. And, and the bottom line is, you know, the nematodes really stress those plants. And, and we know we don't put mepoquat chloride on plants that, have, that are drought stress. But I found out that the same thing goes for nematode stress because basically, and I don't know if you remember that, Gus, but in the plots, the more picks I put on, the worse the yield was. And I had BASF come out and, and we looked at that. I thought, well, we did something wrong. But anyway, it wasn't until the next year that I really realized what the problem was because, you know, I had, I had like 30 foot plots in a 15 foot alleyway where the alleyway was and there was no cotton plant growing. There were no nematodes in the alleys. And Travis and, and uh, Gus, I'm sure you remember that, but the cotton in the alleyways were like almost twice as tall as the cotton in the plots last year from, from the, the nematodes that were there. And so we kind of backed into answering that question, but we just don't put mepoquat chloride. You don't want to put mepoquat chloride on stressed plants because it, it does have a below ground impact on the plant as well as above ground, but it does impact above ground more so than the others. So once more, I want to recognize the importance of the support of Cotton Incorporated and the Arkansas State uh, Support Committee, who uh, through the Cotton Board, uh, the funds uh, for our programs with checkoff uh, funds would not be available. So again, we wanna thank you for your support of our research and extension programs. If you've, uh, and we've pretty well answered all of our questions, so uh, don't have to worry about that. But again, thank you for joining us for our virtual cotton production meeting. If you enjoyed this program, we have additional production meetings coming up with peanuts on the 26th of January. We have uh, another session, marketing new technologies and irrigations on uh, January the 28th. And in the soybeans, we'll wrap this up on February the 2nd. And again, uh, none of the CEU information will be submitted until all of these sessions have been completed. And it may take a little bit because they're going to go through and, and put these together. So it makes it a little bit easier on the, the people that are adding these numbers to your, to your records. But uh, registration for these events are open now. And with that, we're just going to wrap up our program. I want to thank you and, and hope you have a great evening.